You're listening to the DVM Podcast Empire. Now with over one million downloads. One million downloads. Find us online at dvmpe.com. 100% free. One million percent fan. And now, push the button. Is it possible that we have permitted ideology, political and economic philosophies, and governmental policies to keep us from considering the very real everyday problems of our people? So what if my feelings are hurt? Does that give me the right to prevent others from expressing their opinions? Ah, uh, wait a second, Doc! Uh, are you telling me that this sucker is nuclear? Hey, can you push the button? Do not touch that button. Hey, can you push the button? Do not touch that button. Hey, can you push the button? Do not touch that button. Mr. Anderson. Don't push it. Hey, everybody, welcome back to our next episode of Push the Button, your hot button podcast that we want to offend and entertain at the same time. I am your host, David Vox Mullen. And I am your other host, Mr. Anderson. And today... Hey, man. Hey. Oh, sorry. This is the second time now. I, you know, you think I'd figure that out by now. I'm sorry. Anderson. <laughs> well, we're, let's do it. We are going to talk about one of the the biggest hot button issues in at least America today. If Whoa, not, brother. If not the world. Uh, and it's something that you and I both were passionate about bringing up when we first met. This was one of the first ones we wanted to get to. Uh, so I'm excited. This is something we've been planning on for a while, and we're here. And, uh, yes, for those of you who didn't read the episode title before you opened it, this is going to be our discussion on homosexuality slash gay marriage. Uh, this is going to be a uh, touching on religion, touching on a little bit of politics. And with us today... We have a very special guest, good friend of Mr. Anderson's, Father Nels. Thank you for joining us, Father. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, before we go any further, uh, Mr. Anderson, if you could um, kind of talk about why we wanted to do this this particular episode. Well, okay, for me, um, you know, this is a subject that always comes up. It always comes up in discussions with friends, with family. It's on the news constantly. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of gay friends, so this is obviously near and dear to them, and therefore it becomes near and dear to me. You know, when I I, I think uh, I want to see my friends just as happy as I am. I, you know, I'm I'm very happily married, um, and you know when they talk about their aspirations to have that same feeling. Um, I would like to oblige, and I wish that we could oblige, and I wish we could figure out a way to get there. And so I guess that's why this is so important to me. And, um, and you know, that's why I, I – and, and from my understanding, you and I sort of kind of fall on the same same side of the aisle on this one. Is that to right? a degree. I think we have some slight – probably variances, but for the most part, you and I are pretty much on the same page, and I can get into why for myself in a bit, but I want to know specifically from you what kind of opposition you perceive when you're having these conversations. Well, the, the opposition that inevitably comes up is, um, you know, I, I always ask why. Why shouldn't it happen? Why shouldn't it be allowed? Mm -hmm. And the answer that I always get is, well, because... That's the way God intended it was to be a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, well, where do you where do you get that from? I get that from the Bible. And so, uh, you know, and I'd like to discuss uh, you know those passages in the Bible where that where it's mentioned specifically, and uh, which is why I wanted to have Father Nels here. Let's get an expert on the subject because you and I are not once again we <laughs> yes. are not expert theologians. Full disclosure, <laughs> we're not even amateur theologians. <laughs> I know a guy named Theo, and I think that's about as far as I can go. Um, Huxtable? Yes. <laughs> okay, and as we move forward, let's let's get a little bit of background on on you, Father. Now, tell us a little bit about yourself and and where you're coming from. All right. Well, uh, born and raised in uh, in Minnesota here. Um, it was, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, a lot of people ask, oh, how'd you become a priest? I guess, uh, growing up, uh, went to church on Sunday cause mom and dad made me, 
and I was informed that if I was too sick to go to church on Sunday, I was also conveniently too sick to hang out with my friends uh, for the entire week. So uh, I went to church uh, with chicken pox one time. I went, uh, I, I would have gone with Ebola even if I had it. Um, but uh, <laughs> so grew up in uh, Minnesota, but uh, faith, God, all that stuff really wasn't a super big part of my own personal life. Uh, it wasn't until I went to college, um, I went to study to be an engineer. Uh, up at uh, North Dakota State in scenic Fargo, North Dakota. Um, I, I call it scenic because you can, if you stand on your tiptoes, you can see Montana. It's very pretty. Um, <laughs> can you see Russia? I was uh, just going to make that joke. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, so uh, grew up there, um, and that was actually where the whole faith thing became real for me. It wasn't just a, uh, wasn't just kind of a practice that I did. It became something real. So. Uh, after two years of engineering, uh, put that aside, went and studied philosophy and entered seminary. Um, uh, yeah, went and studied seminary and was ordained seven years ago. Um, I was looking for something to do on the weekends. Uh, figured that would work. Um, and uh, to minimize my wardrobe. It's pretty nice. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so uh, I guess that's – and so I, right now I guess – I serve full time as a chaplain and a teacher at one of our high schools here in the Twin Cities. Um, so it's a lot of fun. I, I get to spend all day hanging out with high schoolers. Um, I have an appreciation for parenting now, like I have never had in my sure. life. <laughs> so, so would it be safe to say that you would be considered a Catholic priest? Um, well, I hope so. Okay. Right? <laughs> really well, I, yeah, I just want to make sure we establish your your actual title, yeah. respectively. Well, Catholic, if you want to get very specific. So. Okay. So it's not Greek. No, no, surprisingly. <laughs> um, yeah. But everybody everybody wonders with the first name Nels, which is very Norwegian, how in the world I became a Catholic priest. And that was because my dad was uh, – my dad's Norwegian, so he was raised Lutheran. My mom was raised Catholic. Uh, dad got to pick the name for the kids. Mom got to pick the religion for the kids. <laughs> and uh, everyone was happy. I was just going to say, being up in Minnesota, I'd assume you were a Vikings guy anyway. So You know um, – Honestly, I know I'll offend a lot of people. Take oh, it or, you know what? We could just move past that if you want. <laughs> it's all, all hockey for me. Yeah, but this is only – this is – oh, come on now. I, hey, I'm, well, my, another priest buddy and I are trying to see a game in every NHL arena. It's kind of our, our long-term goal. Uh, so we've been to 19 arenas so far. Um, so it's it's been a lot of fun. And I also – got to throw this out there. Uh, tell them what else you're a big fan of. Uh, you're talking about, okay, uh, sci-fi, is that what you're saying? No, 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 no. <laughs> the band uh, One so Direction? or a big, yeah, a big fan of pro wrestling. Uh, <laughs> in fact, uh, how many how many events have, would you say you've been to? Oh, at least five now in the past year. Um, and uh, and uh, he recently went to a, uh, a pay-per-view addressed as who? Uh, <laughs> all right, so. It's, this, it's is little, a, this is a priest, <laughs> this is a Catholic priest. Uh, a little little context. Um, I enjoy having a lot of fun at these events because the fans are a lot of fun. So, I actually went dressed as two different wrestlers um, while waiting in line. Uh, I was Bad News Barrett, uh, dressed there uh, with a podium and a gavel and yelling at everybody uh, in the British accent. And then, as soon as the doors open, uh, whipped off the jacket uh, and, <laughs> and put a wig on quick and. In about two minutes, I became Roman Reigns, and wow. uh, <laughs> people were getting their pictures with me and stuff. Oh, wow, this is... Um, <laughs> you've lost all credibility, man. I know. Oh. I, know. <laughs> oh, I, I love it. I think it's awesome. <laughs> Pray for me. No, hey, you know what? It's you know what? You, I, I would assume the majority of the listeners are are pro wrestling fans. So I think <laughs> I think we're all right. As am I. And, and don't worry about it. I've, I think I've ruined my fair share of pay per view videos. So. <laughs> and he's also a huge video gamer. And, Very cool. Uh, which is sort of why we started hanging out in the first place, and uh, we've never played video games together. <laughs> and all the times that we've hung out, we just sit and discuss technology. <laughs> all the big questions of the world. Yeah. <laughs> so well, once we've answered them all, <laughs> we can sit down and play some games. Um, okay, so that's totally cool. So what I'd like to do is maybe if you, uh, Father Nels, could uh, maybe present some of those uh, scriptures that uh, that Ken was talking about earlier that that usually come as a point of direct opposition to why uh, homosexuality is quote unquote a sin or wrong or sure. uh, an abomination as I've heard. Okay. Um, 
Well, actually, before I jump into these, and I'm more than happy to more than happy to to bring some of these up. Um, one of the things that's kind of misunderstood, I think, by a lot of people is the at least I'll, I'll say from the Catholic perspective, and and I'll say even then by my own personal perspective, it's not just me towing the party line or anything. Um, it's something that I actually believe. Um, is that the, the I guess one that the church is teaching is not based solely on scripture. Um, it's based upon a whole bunch of other things. Because one of the things that I, that I love about my, my Catholic faith is that um, it's not just because the Bible said so, therefore it is. Mm. Um, it's, it's a lot of um, reason, philosophy, um, natural law, and, and a lot of these other things factored in. Um, so that's one thing I just wanted to say right away is that sure. uh, if, if I, I tried actually to make my arguments – um, for the teaching of marriage being one man, one woman, uh, specifically not Bible-based, um, because I guess in, in our society, obviously we live in a multi-religious society. Mm-hmm. And I, I see what happens in societies when they become a theocracy, because mm-hmm. this is our, we're going to base our entire law system just off of this one religion's teaching. And for a basis for a civil law, just because it's in one particular scripture, can be um, a dangerous thing. Well, and, and look at the Bill of Rights. The very first thing that our founding fathers, the, 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 the most important thing, number one that came to the top of their heads was, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Right. Right? Mm-hmm. And so that's, so that's one of the things where I... Uh, I would be extremely hesitant to move forward with any ideas that make this a law purely based on the fact that it is um, based off of a particular scripture. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, that would be now I, I don't deny that many scriptures will support laws that we've created. For example, mm-hmm. um, you know, we have laws in our society that prohibit murder. Um, we came up with those laws not because it's in the Ten Commandments, right? but because it's based on how do you make a successful society based on what we know about us as human beings. So um, so a, a lot of the arguments that, that I try to present when I'm in public discourse are not based upon Scripture. Now, I don't deny that if you have, say, two believing people that are in conversation and you both say, hey, we believe the Bible to be uh, you know, a guide for truth, um, then, yeah, we're, you know, amongst yourselves, amongst you know my fellow Catholics, I can definitely turn to scripture and sacred tradition in the church. Um, but for public discourse, um, it can be a dangerous thing. And that's, I don't know, you know, Ken and I have talked about this too. But. Is that the majority viewpoint, though? Because most of the people that I come into contact with, when I ask them, why, why can't this be, I'm told, invariably, it's because it's in the Bible. Right. So I... I Right. No, I, I would. I would. That's a. That's a great point you bring up yeah. because I would say I am in the minority of people who say that marriage is one man, one woman right now, uh, because I would say I'm in the minority because I'm. I'm trying to base my arguments for our public society not based on purely scripture. Right. Um, but I would say a majority of the people who are. I, well, I might. Be, I mean, this is just my guessing, but a majority of the people who are opposed to uh, gay marriage, um, they're strongest argument that they have from their own perspective is because the Bible says so. Right. And 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 and, and I already got a sense of where you're going to be standing at now. Uh, and this is not going to work. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but uh, I definitely want to point I want to I want to expose uh, if I could. I want to expose the 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 verses. Uh, sure. And I and I hope you've pulled them up there because I I want yeah. I want to at least say to the public, this, these are the the verses that people are wrapping their justification in. Whether it's right or wrong, that's what we're going to try to tackle. But I definitely want to at least get it recorded here. These are the words that are being used, and then we'll get into more of the mindset and society and why. And not, because I think we're all going to end up agreeing anyway. But <laughs> but um, but I want to I want to get those out there first. Okay, so so the first verse that I come across in the Bible were. Anything is even remotely mentioned about homosexuality or sexuality uh, is Leviticus 18. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Leviticus 20. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, 
Both of them have committed an abomination, and they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So that's the that's the Old Testament, obviously. Um, but well, and, and when you say that, that does imply a lot. Um, you know, and we can definitely get into the differences between the God that's depicted in the Old Testament and the God that's depicted in the New Testament. Many Christians would say, hey, well, that's still the same God. Uh, and I believe he is, but there's there's more to it than that. Um, yeah, well, I guess responding to that one, I mean, that's I guess that one comes down to um, definitely a, a person's theology, like how do you read the Bible? Um, and as you can see, like even within Christianity as a whole, you'll have some Christian denominations who have the exact same Bible, um, and you'll have you'll have some that say, "Hey, this Bible still teaches that it's okay to have gay marriage." You'll have others that um, take another ridiculous extreme of you know trying to exterminate. I mean, it's just you yeah. know. So, well, uh, let's let's look into uh, you know in in our amateur theology. Let's let's look into who 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 was speaking that. And and who was God intending that for? That was spoken to Moses by God, I believe, right? Well, there herein lies why I went to six years of school. Um, <laughs> That's why we're asking you. Exactly. All right, uh, <laughs> fair enough. Um, well, so the the best way. I, okay, now I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go full on Catholic here with how please, I please please oh, go right ahead. Okay. All right. Um, so when it comes to reading the scriptures, at least from the Catholic perspective, we can't take every book of the Bible. Um, exactly the same way. Um, so, for example, uh, the book of Genesis, for example, let's take that, you know, the whole creation story and the first sin. Um, I believe, for example, that that is trying to teach truths about who God is and who we are. It's not trying to teach, for example, a, um, a, a scientific history. For example, I do not believe that there was a time when snakes could talk. Mm -hmm. Point and simple. Mm -hmm. um, I still believe Genesis to be true, but I don't believe that there was a time of talking snakes. So when I read Genesis, for example, I'm not mining it for scientific truths. Like uh, there's this one this one meme that I found that was absolutely hysterical. So um, this is this is uh, God speaking to Moses. He says, "All right, Moses, you got to get ready to write this story of Genesis down." He's like, "All right, write this." In the beginning, I created the universe from a singularity in which all the energy and matter was compressed into a hyperheated state with all three interactions of the standard model merged into one single interaction characterized by one large gauge symmetry and thus unified and coupling constant. And then Moses pauses and gives him this stare. And then God says, uh, never mind, let me rephrase that. In the beginning, I created the heavens and the earth. You know, and... I love <laughs> it, that. It, you know, and it kind of gets to the point of, like, what is... The book of Genesis about what is it trying to teach? And I use uh, Ken and I talked about this before, but I always use the example like the book, The Little Engine That Could. Um, it is not a history textbook. There was not a time when we had talking locomotives. Yet I would argue there are truths that that author was trying to communicate to children about the virtues of perseverance, the virtues of of working hard. Mm -hmm. um, not to try to convince kids that they can go up and talk to Thomas the Tank Engine and uh, have a nice afternoon. Um, so when, a, when from the Catholic perspective we read, for example, the book of Genesis, you got to know what was it written to be? What was the intention of the author? What was going on in the world? And so then, but let's say, let's fast forward to the New Testament, to like Paul's letter to the Romans. Mm -hmm. We know Paul is writing to a group of people in Rome, and this is a letter. So it's much more instructional, encouraging, in the same way we would write letters, okay, emails, uh, to one another. <laughs> okay, tweets, fine. Um, you know. 140, 140 characters or less, please. <laughs> that would, that Think you could have done it? Yeah. Tweet uh, longer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think there is somebody out there who's actually tweeting the Bible. Um, in 140, like, yeah, I guarantee there is somebody doing it. God bless that person, but I ain't doing it. Oh, God oh. stop that person. Exactly. <laughs> it's like quit filling Twitter. Well, so anyway, I'm sorry. So what I'm what I'm gathering here is that you're saying that Genesis is allegory. No, I wouldn't go so far as to say allegory because that's a rather precise one. Because um, that would mean allegory would be like, um, okay, this tree equals you know, the town or whatever. Um, but, but that I, literally, no, no, I, I literally true. I do not. I, you don't I believe that God 
created the first man out of a mound of dirt and then took his no. rib out and created no. a woman? Nope. No, I don't. Um, I, I have no issue with what science proves to be true. If science proves that evolution is true, awesome. Um, then it's true. Um, it let, me, let, me, let me stop you real quick here. Yeah, uh, sure. I, I don't want to interrupt you on purpose, but to interrupt you. Um, I, I like what you touched on here. You said you don't have any problem with what science proves to be true. Uh, and I like that, because especially that meme you joked about, because that's that's really... Uh, Ken and I have spoken off this podcast, off air, about uh, like a father trying to talk to his or her children. Yeah. And, you know, trying to explain something to a child who, who's just clearly not mentally equipped to handle the information. And if we come from a place where we believe that God is uh, the creator and sustainer of the universe, then if our highest paid physicists who are still struggling to figure these things out, um, can't just explain it to a four-year-old, then then how could we expect God, who would be then more um, knowledgeable, I would hope, <laughs> yeah, no to to explain it to man, uh, who is already at the get-go broken. Well, but he's God. Sure. C- couldn't he? He couldn't come up with a a, a, a different way of putting things. Well, I would argue that he, yeah, no, 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 exactly. I I would argue that uh, what he came up with was necessary at the time. Yeah. If that makes sense. Well. For his people at the time. Well, precisely. And and that's one of the fascinating things about, about, well, again, the the whole idea and the concept of salvation history. Mm -hmm. Um, That's one of the phrases that we'll often use in Catholic theology is that God chooses to, operate inside of time, even though he himself is, by his very nature, outside of time, chooses to, uh, the phrase that we often use is, unfold his, his story of salvation um, in, in time. So, for example, I mean, he could have, uh, right as soon as Adam and Eve sinned the first time, Jesus could have shown up, hey, I'm Jesus, here to save you, just quit crucify me, we'll be good to go. That's what I, I you know, yeah. he could have. Well, see, we also have to go under the assumption, and I know that, that Father Nels and I are going to agree on this, but we have to, for some people who maybe aren't aware, we have to also work under the assumption that Jesus always was. <coughs> oh, that, sure. That he was there in the beginning as well, because a lot of people have a hard time understanding that as well. Um, but that's part of the Trinity. That's part of the whole thing. It's in the beginning, uh, God said, let us make man in our image. And I and I am one of the people who believe that he was speaking to Christ and the Holy Spirit at the same time because they do not operate inside the realm of time linear that we exist in. But that I, there's plenty of Christians who say I'm crazy when I talk like that. So it's it's tough. No, it's true. That's true. So I, I guess I mean maybe we're maybe we're already a little far. Um, so I guess it was, I don't know. It was yeah, there. we've sort of gotten. <laughs> it, well, and I knew that was going to happen. That's why I wanted to. This happens in yeah. these discussions. Um, so let's bring it back. Let's bring it back. So, so the, the stuff in Leviticus, the Old Testament, this was stuff that he had charged Moses with telling uh, the the nation of Israel, uh, this is what I don't want you to do. Now, I've heard the argument that God specified that because at that time, it was extremely important that the small nation of Israel needed to grow. And it's very important that, you know, if if man is laying with a man then and woman lays with a woman, then obviously reproduction is not going to happen. And one of the commands that God does give us is be fruitful and multiply. Sure. Well, um, you know, and, and I mean, and, and I think there's a lot of, you know, basis for that. Um, but it, it begs a different question, though, I, I would argue, um, that goes all the way back, maybe even further back to Genesis. Why did... Why would God have made us male and female? Why would he create gender differences in this creature he's making? Well, I think initially he created man because he he wanted to, and he was God, and he can. Um, (laughs) And and then if I'm correct, and again, and I haven't read this, I've not read the scripture in a long time, but if I'm correct, wasn't it that man became lonely? Well, that's he needed a companion or something like that, right? And that's one of those fundamental things that will be part of like uh, my my spiritual basis for the discussion as far as what marriage is. Um, there's there's a complementarity 
in the sexual in the in the sexual differences of a man and a woman, um, obviously expressed in the physiological, you know, that you see there. But but there's a there's a complementarity. It, it was the first time that he looked at you know Adam looks at woman and he and he discovers somebody like him, human, but yet different. Subtle differences, yeah. Yeah, and well, actually, I wouldn't I wouldn't argue subtle. I mean, I would argue very pronounced differences. Um, you know, I mean, how many comedians would be out of business if there were differences yeah. between men and women? Yeah, exactly. Um, and so he, so he looks at it, and, and so there's, there's that whole idea of, of complementarity where the, the two are, are literally both in, in their social, in their mental, and in their physical made for each other. Okay. And so it, it, it comes back to that. I mean, because God could have made us as asexual beings. Okay. Mm-hmm. Just reproduce randomly, you know, or, in t- you know. In that t- would have solved a lot of problems. <laughs> no doubt. Oh, my gosh. How many marriages? And there are some uh, animals in the animal kingdom that are asexual. Mm-hmm. There are. There are a few. So he was capable. And, uh, and um, there are some plants that are capable of self-reproduction. Without a doubt. Um, but, okay, so God made everything. Then why is it that we have, you know, Depending on what statistics you look at, three to ten percent of all animals in the animal kingdom uh, display this type of behavior, this homosexuality. Why did he, if he created everything, then why does he, why do we have homosexuality to begin with? Well, one could ask the question, then why do we have tendencies to anything um, that would be, if you will, yeah, I, I, um, I'm I'm cool with you know, you know uh, so I, I you know. The uh, why why is because that's that's the whole question I guess another question man you're good at bringing up questions you should start a podcast this is awesome um, so the uh, so that whole idea of you know God made me this way um, has been brought up and um, it, to me that's a very very weak argument um, not because I'm saying it's scientifically um, unprovable which it, you know it hasn't been Wait, are, are you are you saying uh, when 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 a person who is uh, gay says yeah. I was born this way you're saying that's a weak argument yeah I, I would say it's a weak argument not because I don't deny that that person has had those inclinations from day one uh, I don't deny that um, that's their own personal experience and I, I who am I to doubt what their own personal experience was of that but by that argument then. Um, a person born without an arm, God made them that way, and therefore it would be a sin for us or bad for us to try to help that person have an arm. Or if a person um, was born with, uh, say, um, some sort of, uh, uh, you know, a, a, well, you know, you can even say like uh, some sort of mental capacity that's diminished, it would be wrong for us then to try to help that person reach their maximum mental potential. So mm-hmm. I say it's a weak argument. Not because it's not, it personally is very strong for them, but as far as for public discourse to say that I was born this way, therefore it is good. Um, there's a lot of then what we label in our society as disorders then that we should not try to cure by that following that same line of logic. Well, but if you say that God intended for something to be that way, just because the majority of his creation is a certain way, mm-hmm. Does that well? Let's, so he didn't intend for well, there's, there's people a, to be born homosexual or or to have those tendencies or for those people to have those diminished. Well, let me let me jump in here. Sure. Where does where do these come from? Yeah, let, let me jump in here real quick. Um, I want I want to go backwards a little bit, <laughs> uh, which I think is never a bad thing. Go no. back and kind of restart. Um, from my understanding, at least what I was taught, um, and not taught biblically but just taught from my parents and out of love and things like that, is that sex was something that God created to be a beautiful thing. Uh, it was, it was, I, I was taught that it was a gift from God. Um, and it was obviously amazing for any of us who have experienced it. And um, that, wasn't, that, that hey, wasn't like a... <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a personal attack on you, Father. Uh, I'm oh, just no, saying. Wouldn't be the first. No. I'm just saying there's something you might be missing. Anyway, um, uh, but that being said, the uh, the the concept of sex was, I personally come from a belief that it was created by God for man, for Adam and Eve when they, when they were created. Um. And it was a beautiful thing. But I think what also comes into play, and this is where a lot of, uh, I'm sure, atheists and skeptics will have a hard time with it, because if I believe in God, I also have to believe in Satan. And I think that 
um, believing in Satan gives me the option to see that he was jealous of what God had created, um, uh, so many things. And, and again, I could be wrong, but these, these are just little things that I've thought of over the years. But I believe that, that Satan was very jealous of the gift that God created for mankind and perverted it. And uh, I'm not specifically saying that homosexuality itself is or is not a perversion of it, but it's, it is it um, is the 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 initial gift of sex, I have no doubt, was designed from God to be between a man and a woman. But that does not mean that I believe it's the exact same scenario today. I think at that point in time it was necessary for the reproduction process, was whatnot. Um, and I think that, you know, there was... The devil had a lot to gain by perverting and twisting this beautiful thing. Uh, he was angry at God. He was he was jealous of man that God created. Um, and we can obviously do another podcast at some point in the future talking about the devil. But oh, um, doing on sex. Okay. <laughs> but but the point is, <laughs> hey, we the, can hit that. But the point I'm making is, I you know, as time progresses, as hundreds of years go by, as thousands of years go by. Sex is so far removed. I mean, I don't think any of us would disagree that today what is considered sexual is not exactly the same thing as it was even 30 years ago, as it was 200 years ago, as it was 5,000 years ago. Um, sex is constantly changing in a society. Romans did it differently. Greeks did it differently. Um, Hindus do it differently. Hasidic Jews do it differently. We do it differently. Um and I I think there's a lot to be said for that. And I can understand why somebody who has sex maybe a little differently than somebody else doesn't understand why it's wrong or if it's wrong or why, why it's... I can understand why it hurts to be told that what I think is love is wrong. And that's, that's, that's my biggest complaint about it. And, it's, and I think that's where Ken's coming from. Is you know are we are we are we confusing the act of sex with love itself? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, because unfortunately, I can honestly admit that I've had plenty of sex that love was not involved, and <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, and 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 I and and it, and it was heartbreaking in 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 the long run. It was, um, and I'm sure there's people out there who would agree or disagree with me. Um, I disagree with you. <laughs> Every time you've had sex, you've had love? Uh, no, but it wasn't heartbreaking. Oh, well, <laughs> in the long run, it was for me personally. I felt very empty and lonely and whatnot. I'm but... kidding, honey. <laughs> no, you just say, honey, with you, it's been perfect every time. Yes. <laughs> So but that's that's kind of where I'm at, and so I want to. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess so. Confession, <laughs> Father, right. forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. How long has it been since your last confession? It's been about uh, 30, 38 years. <laughs> I happen to be thirty-eight years old. So, uh... Uh, anyway, but that's yeah. that's kind of where I'm at. That's that's but, where I want to dig into more. That I I come from a place of love, and and I really want to to dig in more of that because I think there's a lot that we get hung up on. Um, on, you know, just what what we consider sin, and you know what what is, what is sin? You know, based, oh, any, you know anything that God says don't do and you do it anyway. I mean, there's so many different things. I know I'm playing naive, but I'm doing that on purpose. But, but the, the thing is, is that here's my problem: is that you guys, you know, we just talked about that the the idea that Genesis wasn't literal. That you know, Father Nels said he doesn't believe that the first man was created out of a mound of dirt, and divine breath, in a magic garden. Um, but then when you say that when God created the first man and the first woman, well, scientifically, we know that's not how it happened. Or, you, know, you look at evolution, we are all made from the same stuff. We all kind of came from the same stuff. Well, let me say, first off, I didn't say I agreed with Father Nels. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, and that being said, I also don't feel that scientifically that what you're thinking of, um, single-celled organism, amoeba, bubbling up primordial soup, is necessarily in direct opposition to God creating Adam out of mud. Do you know what I mean? Touché. <laughs> and, and that's not the point. It's, it's not to be a touche thing. It's just, when, and this is the beauty of the fact that we're all different people. We all see things differently. But um, 
for me, when somebody goes, oh, it's not God created it, it's primordial soup, and I'm going, no, but I can see that that could be the hand of God. Right. Because yeah. cause let's, let's just get literal for a minute. Uh, not that this, <laughs> of course, we're going way off the wall here, but, <laughs> but primordially, there was nothing, and then there was something. And that, to me, is miraculous, and that's beautiful, and that's awesome. And I don't care if it's uh, two organisms that never touched, and all of a sudden they're touching and reproducing and creating cellular division, and boom, man. I, I don't have a problem with that at all. I think that is scientifically proven. And to me, that just goes, yeah, see, this is what God said he did, and here's the proof. Um, some people don't subscribe to that, and, and, and that's – here's the thing. <laughs> I got a feeling that the majority of the people, and we've talked about this in the last podcast, Ken, the majority of the people who don't necessarily agree, I think it really boils down to it's mankind and his own ignorance and fear. And so when man doesn't understand something that some other person is doing or involved in or um, a lifestyle, Yes. Because they don't understand it, what do they do? They fear it. Well, why do they fear? Well, they don't know why they fear. So what they do, they look for the closest justification they can. And they find that there is things that God told people 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, or whatever, in the nation of Israel. You know, this is what I want for these people for this specific point in time. You know, these were, these were God's chosen people. You know, we have to go off the understanding, too, that before salvation, we weren't. You know, we were Gentiles. We weren't supposed to get that gift. You know what I mean? So, you know, I don't want to offend our Jewish listeners, but if they hadn't screwed up so bad the way they did, the gift of Christ wouldn't have been for us. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in there. And this Please I guess, do, because I feel like right. I'm just making up stuff as I go along. No, no, that's all right. That's all right. Uh, the, um, the, the thing, I guess, yeah, this is part of what I would argue, actually, where – the Jewish people um, still have that covenant relationship with God. This, again, this is the Catholic perspective, that that covenant is still honored, um, but found, finds its fulfillment certainly in Jesus Christ, where that's part of the unfolding of salvation history, that God's actual intention was to have the nation of Israel be his chosen people, but for the purposes of inspiring the rest of humanity I to, totally agree with that. to live in that way. And then it's just kind of this God said, okay, we're going to just unfold it little by little and, and have full revelation. Kind of like you were describing, like you guys had talked about last time about a, you know, a father trying to teach his kids. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, the same is true with humanity as a whole. As we begin to understand God can explain it in deeper, more intimate ways um, to, to us. And eventually he comes down and, you know, the person of Jesus Christ is, you know, the, the one to be the full revelation of who God is because by his very claim, you know, he is God, the great I am. And so here he is walking the earth and teaching what he's teaching. And well, that's the thing where for me, the, the entire, to try to interpret Genesis without and not in light of Jesus Christ, just kind of as its own single volume standing there or Leviticus without without the context of Christ, is, is well, not how Christians would interpret it. Uh, that you have to go back to the basically the, the but, source but of But the it. people before Christ wouldn't have had that option. No, no, without a doubt. Um, and, and so they didn't, so they had to go with what they had, and that's how the, how the life would have been lived in that way. Um, but that's because it needed to be unfolded throughout history. So, uh, you know, and that's why I always, I always um, am very hesitant to just jump into with some of my Christian brothers and sisters who will say, you know, okay, well, this passage here, that passage there, that passage there, put them all together, and this is what you get. Because I always say, like, the Bible shouldn't be called a book. It should really be called a library. Yeah, it's a collection of different stories. Right. Well, and, and let me just kind of jump a little bit here, but there are 613 laws in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. right? Yep, Leviticus, yeah. And, uh... This is the one that gets singled out for some reason. There, Thank you. there are laws about, you know, you're supposed to wear tassels on your clothing. You're you don't? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, Ken, that's that's exactly my point. Is You're not is, supposed to eat shellfish. Uh, yeah, there's, there's so many things that God had instructed his people at that time to do, not to do. Are you wearing, is that shirt you're wearing a cotton polyester blend, Father? Uh, I, uh... 
Okay, don't tell Jesus. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to have to go outside. You, you see to... what I mean? You see what I mean, though? But I think you rose an excellent question, Ken, it is is why is this one such a, such a hot-button issue? Why do we not make laws against people consuming shrimp and lobster and clams? And, and again, I think it comes back to what I was trying to articulate poorly earlier, which was uh, a lot of people don't understand it. It's different than the way that they're used to doing it. You know, homosexual sex doesn't fit what they grew up knowing. So instead of coming from a place of understanding, I mean, look at racism. Look at, you know, sexism. We we, we, we as a humankind are are infamous with screwing this stuff up and taking us years and years and years to kind of getting to a point where we go, oh, I get it now. Maybe women should get paid the same as men for the same job, or you know what I mean. But a novel concept. But that, but but what I'm saying is, is we we are currently living in an era, and I think it's interesting that we're we're kind of we're we're actually I think hitting the peak of that era and starting to break through to a new generation. But we currently, for the last so many hundreds of years, lived in a generation where man did not understand. They didn't they had no interest in understanding. It was un, it was un, un, it was uncomfortable. It was confusing. It was. Uh, well, I know that some people have even gone so far as to say that it, it's 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 dirty or it's. It, these are all subjective judgments yeah, yeah. from fearful people, and I think that's probably. Be, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. All right. All right, all right, all right. Well, what's what's interesting though is it's it's interesting that you brought up um, other societies and other historical uh, colony or groups of people, mm-hmm. um, because we do know that certainly the Romans had no issue with, for example, um, uh, homosexual sex. I mean, it, right. it's well documented that that was just kind of a part of their public life. But what is interesting though is the Roman society, despite the fact that they had a general acceptance that this was a way that you live life, they never attempted even to define that as marriage. Same thing with the Greeks. You know, they and many, many other societies where they had no issue with it as as we can see from the documents and the archaeological digs we found. Um, so I mean if you've ever been to Pompeii for example, um, there you know it's inscribed their their houses they've uncovered that it uh, they had actual carvings of which type of I'll uh, just call them services you could receive <laughs> at each of these stations. <laughs> In case you couldn't read, you can look at the picture and you go, oh, all right, I'll take one of those and one of those and I'll swing over there. But I'm um, sure people like Pat Robertson would say, and that's why Pompeii blew up. It, well, yeah, that's why it was and, buried. And that's where, uh, anyway, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, because I have trouble sometimes, but the, um, uh, but anyway, so, um, but yet that society never even attempted. We have nothing to, um, to give any evidence that they would recognize anything else as marriage. And I, and that to me is the, the fundamental question in this, in this whole case. It's like, what is marriage? And, and that's the question that I'm not, because a lot of people, like you're saying, um, have personal reactions to the activities, mm-hmm. uh, you know, of sexual, be they heterosexual or homosexual or whatever. People have various reactions, and unfortunately, sometimes they let personal reactions influence both what they believe rather than truth and um, philosophy and, you know, in a well understood that, um, ideas. And so it's, um, it's one of these where I, that's, that's the fundamental question that, that I want to see discussed in society is, what is marriage? Because marriage as a concept has existed well before the Bible, mm-hmm. has existed in cultures that have no scriptural basis, um, have, have very little or anything to do with, with um, various deities. Um, yet, the concept of marriage has been essentially universal. And what's fascinating about it is almost completely, I, I can't say totally, but almost completely, Every society has had some sort of governmental regulation of this concept of marriage. Now, maybe the government was just the elders in a society, mm-hmm. uh, or it might have been as structured as we have it with a, with the documentation. But every everyone basically that I know of has had some sort of governmental involvement in this concept of marriage, and the universal understanding across cultures uh, was this is what marriage has been and, and ought to be, even if they allowed and permitted and encouraged um, all kinds of other sexual practices. But why? Why is that uh, even necessary? There's, the, there's a fundamental question. And, and can't we, I mean, 
even though it's been this way for so long, mm-hmm. can't we change our opinions? Can't we change our change the way things are done? Because slavery was also pretty universally pretty universally yeah. accepted. Yeah. Yep. Until about fifty years ago, mm-hmm. and it still is. It's still practiced in other countries. Right? I was just going to say, aren't we so better than everyone else because we don't do that anymore? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah well, no, I mean, I, I agree with that statement entirely, but unfortunately we're discovering that slavery has taken on a different way of expressing itself in our society today with sex slavery. You know, unfortunately it's become, mm-hmm. you know, quite prominent, but that's a whole other podcast. Um, the, uh, yeah, dude, I, I, we're going to be doing a lot of podcasts. Yeah, yeah we're going to be here forever. It's, I've got so many to give you. I'll write them down. I'll, be all, I'll find all kinds of controversial stuff. <laughs> we'll do one on what people tell me in confessions. No, I'm kidding. Oh, I'm kidding. Whoa, I'm kidding. I know. I'd be excommunicated. So, um, we'll we'll like, just change his voice and say that it's a different guy. <laughs> and, you know. Well, there's one guy who came into confession. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Anyway, um, the... Uh, well, that and that's where the, the question needs to become, what is marriage? Because here's the thing is, if, if marriage has no basis in science, in, um, in sociology, in something other than religion, this is where the fundamental thing comes down. Because people will say, well, this is what I think marriage is. Is marriage a redefinable term? Or is it something objective? For example, I can't redefine what, uh, let's say, a dog is. A dog is, you know, the definition of what a dog is is based off of something objective, science. Um, you know, it has this makeup. It's from this species. I can't. I might want. But a, a million years from now, the dog continues to evolve. Sure. So you will redefine it. Sure. If, but then it's no longer a dog if it's evolved. I haven't redefined it. <clears throat> it itself has become something other than what it was. So That's to take a page out of, of Ken's question, then I would I would say, wouldn't it be fair to assume in our current society that what would be considered um, a union between two people has evolved by now? Well, that's, there, therein lies the question is what what and well, it comes back to it. I mean, is just a union between two people? Is that the definition of marriage? And if that's the definition of marriage that we're going with as a society, I want to ask the question. On what is that base? Because if we're going to have a law that is made about something that's regulating relationships, I want it to be based off of something other than this is my opinion. Because if we're going to just mm-hmm. make opinions that are not based upon anything other than my feeling, I don't want that to be a law. I don't. I don't want that because then you. That, okay, today then. Well, guess what? Then slavery is okay. Well, and I, I, I personally, I don't want. I don't think there should be any laws about marriage to begin with. I, don't I agree with that. Should be involved at all. Period. But it it is, and these are the facts, and so we have to deal with those facts as they're presented to us. So, right. so yeah, in, a, in an idealistic setting, because Ken and I, I know politically, we kind of fall on the same side here. But, but I, I am of the mindset that. Uh, I like the idea of separation of church and state, and therefore those two entities should not try to govern each other. Fair enough. And that, well, that's why, like for myself as a Catholic, I, I try to make my arguments for the public policies yeah. not based on Scripture. Because yeah. I, I, I don't that, – that's why – unfortunately, I haven't even gotten to that yet. <laughs> but, um, but that's why I always try to break down the scriptural arguments because I see them as not, not only not helpful but sometimes in, just simply ineffective mm. for public policy. Um, I, I don't deny that there can be certainly interaction between church and state, um, but uh, just dictation of what the state should pass as laws based solely off of um, uh, personal theological claims is is tough and perhaps even dangerous. Um, so that's why that, that fundamental question, I think, needs to come back to what is marriage? And... You know, the, the claimants that I will make will be based off of things, um, obviously biology, um, based off of things of sociology, psychology, history. I mean, if you want religious, I can make those arguments. Um, and whereas many people who want to change the definition of marriage uh, legally, which many states have at this point. Um, Mine just did this week. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. I remember reading about that. Yeah. And Minnesota just, what, six months ago? Um, is it legal now? Yeah, it is. Or, no, maybe a year ago. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's legal now. It is. Um, yeah, because one of my one of my friends is going to be going to get legally married. So you, uh, to her partner. So I take it you will not be officiating. I will so, not. I will uh, not. But I, you know. But here's the thing. Okay. I'll do it if they want me to. <laughs> nice. uh, Are no, you ordained? No, but for like fifty bucks, I can be. 
<laughs> well, I can, there's cheaper ones I can show you on the list. Um, yeah. <laughs> Mine cost me six years of my life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but no, no, uh, you know, so no, but here's the thing is, okay, my friend, she's going to be marrying her, her, uh, you know, soon to be legally spoken wife. Um, now, does that mean that I'm going to ostracize? Absolutely not. Will I still go over to their house for dinner? Of course I will. Are they, is she still my friend? Yeah, without a doubt. Um, do I have any issue, you know, going up and greeting her? Uh, not at all. You know, um, just because, um, I disagree with her on a, on a moral stance, does not mean that that abrogates my call to, you know, certainly as just a Christian, but especially as a priest, to love. Uh, you know, now, if she wants to bring it up and have discussions about it, oh, uh, I'll chat till the day is, you know, till the day is done. Sure, but should, should that be prevented? Should, you know, because we have those differences, mm -hmm. should their happiness be affected by... So, Ken, are you asking on a political level now? Yes. Okay. So that's that's a fair that's a fair question, but here herein lies I guess another because because my because faith aside have, I would say no <laughs> because we all have differing views and, and yeah. because this is a giant melting pot of different faiths mm -hmm. non faith we don't all believe the same thing they believe one way you believe another way should your belief trump theirs and prevent them from being able to obtain that level of happiness that they are about to at least attempt to find. Sure. Um, well, I guess this, this then comes down to questions as far as law. So one of the things that I think is kind of a little bit of a misnomer is that in, in the states that have not yet passed this, that gay marriage is, quote unquote, illegal is often the term that's used. But laws are passed in such a way where they will what the way that laws are set up is there are certain actions that they prohibit mm -hmm. that are explicitly this is something that you cannot do. There are certain actions that are permitted. Um, you know, what color shirt you wear. There, there's no law governing what color shirt you wear, or if you want to wear your geeky Star Wars shirt today, um, you know, that's <laughs> you're, you're allowed to. Um, you everybody knows Star Trek's better. Um you oh, know. Brother. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's this is another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we got them all. Uh, so there's there's prohibited actions, there's permitted actions, and there's what they what we call I, I label promoted actions. So for example, you get a tax break if you make uh, or you get a tax you know benefit if you make a donation to a charity because the government wants to support that action mm -hmm. because they they see it as making society better in some capacity. So to, to say that, you know, two people coming together and professing their love for one another and making a, a, a lifetime commitment for even two people of the same gender was never a prohibited action. I mean, well, I suppose at times it was, unfortunately, you know, um, but now in, in the society as it exists today in 2014, um, I don't know of any, of any state that has prohibited that activity in 2014. And you're talking about a civil union. Oh, correct. Yep. So, well, no, no, not necessarily civil yet, um, okay. because civil would mean that the government has gotten involved. Um, no, I, I think you're you're just saying. Let me paraphrase. Sure. You're, you're yeah. saying that at no point in our history have we prohibited two people. Well, no, no. Well, there there have to see. That comes back to the question. Yeah, because well, a, a black right, woman right. at well, one exactly. point was not allowed to marry marry a black man right. or a, oh, a yeah. white one. Right. Oh no, and there were prohibitions. And so yeah. I'm not saying at no point in our history. What I'm saying is that right now in 2014. Okay. But but this though rewinds that question is is the government the one to tell me if I am married or not? Mm. Because you know it's interesting that you said. Um, should these two people who now can get civilly married, should they be allowed to find that happiness? Well, I think most, um, I don't want to speak universally, but um, I would guess most people who are married say the government doesn't define whether or not my marriage is happy or whether this path to happiness no. is found there. It is the fact that I am sharing my life with this other person, that I have made this lifetime commitment in some capacity, that the government doesn't bring that happiness. We bring it in our shared experience of life together. So to say that, you know, that now that the government recognizes it, I would say doesn't necessarily bring a new level of happiness to their lives. And it comes back again to that question, what is marriage? Because marriage is, has existed before governments have existed. 
and and that path to happiness. I mean, so it comes back to again, what is marriage? I and mean, because if we're going to discuss it, we have to have some shared basis on what we're discussing. And but so, I think it means yeah. different things to different people. You know, uh, the the opinion that my wife has about our marriage is completely different from mine. Well, not completely different, but don't tell her she, that. She views. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to have marital classes one on one. I'm just Kenny. kidding. Hi. <laughs> uh, seriously, uh, you know, she, so our betrothment mm-hmm. as something. Beautiful that we, you know, we took our vows in front of not only our family and friends, but in front of God Mm -hmm. and made this agreement, this covenant with him. And I don't believe that. I I believe that I I wanted to marry my wife because I want to spend the rest of my life with her because she makes me happy. And, Mm. you know, so for me, marriage is different. So can't marriage be defined differently by different people. Well, I, I don't deny that that's a, that that can be done. You know, that, I mean, by, by the logic of it, any type of relationship or any type of thing, object, can be defined differently. But then, then this comes back to a question, I guess, so maybe a, even a more philosophical question. Is there objective truth as to what something is? Uh, is there truth out there that we can understand whether or not we actually understand it properly um is there truth out there and can we know it i mean that and that comes back to that fun that's that's i think the core one of the core questions i mean that's what like um, no, that's been debated for millennia but and it'll continue to be debated what no i thought we closed it <laughs> <laughs> um, you know but uh, but i think that has to be that that almost has to be established because if then if marriage is whatever you want to define it, then in a certain sense it is nothing. If it's definable however a person wants, then, well, but, then we but, can't even use the term marriage. Because when when you say marriage, when I like we will have a shared idea of a concept of like when you say my car, I have a concept in my mind of what a car is. I, I don't envision a tree, I don't envision uh, you know, a cow, I envision an automobile. Yeah. Um so when we talk about marriage we are, we have to have some sh- at minimum some shared concept of what this is. I because- I know where you're going with this, and I, and I only want I only want to interject because I think in the next ten to fifteen years that whole concept will be irrelevant because oh, so- because the majority of the country will pass all the laws that'll allow same sex marriage, and within a generation or two it'll just become the norm, and therefore marriage from five generations ago you, you will not be the same model that is today for oh. 20 years from now. So I honestly feel like, it, you know, in the next two decades, it's not that it's not going to matter, but I honestly believe we're not going to care as much. I really do. Well, okay. I mean, but, you know, as a society, we probably, well, we'll find out, I guess. But, yeah. uh, but I think, I think this one will hang around because the whole concept of marriage affects basically every human being, you know, um, at least in our society, um, because many people are raised in, in that or um, lives are changed because of the breakup of a marriage or the beginning of a marriage. Um, so the whole concept of marriage, I think, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, my thought is that this one's going to hang around uh, permanently because it's, a, it's a, basically a universal encounter with this type of relationship. But, but that being said, I think when we get to the political aspect, which I, I hate to say it, but it seems very cold. Um, oh. I don't I don't like it. <laughs> it's very cold, and there's no there's no warmth. There's no compassion in this discussion. Not this one particularly. I just mean mm-hmm. in, in society when we talk about the laws. And you know, I, I come from a, from a point of saying, then why are we even talking about it? Why why are we even trying to legislate it? Why 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 are we even bothering to deal with it? If well, it's a moral issue, if it's a spiritual issue, if it's a religious issue, then let it be that and let them work it out. But, mm-hmm. but as far as you know, what I can and can't legally do or pay my taxes or whatnot, that has nothing to do with it. I personally believe. Well, and I think we should just get away from that conversation legally. Sure. Well, in this, this, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm sorry that I keep saying it, but, you know, this, this, I guess, a different question then. Why did governments even get involved in regulating, uh, you know, 
to some to any capacity. Money. Money. <laughs> <laughs> Money. Well, I'll I'll say this though. What what about um, non uh, monetary groups of people that have existed, nomads and uh, tribes that that had no monetary system, yet they still had regulations, control regarding who and at what at what age. Uh, well, I mean, it, you, one may say that, but. Um, that's a rather it's simplistic. It's, it's, it's like, control. You know, they wanted to control the populace. Why? Why would they want to control the populace? So that they don't overtake them and take their powerful positions. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, I mean, but based based on what would would we would we say that? Just you know, because I've seen people who like to have control and have power. Because um, whoever has the power doesn't want to lose it, and they've seen other nations, even presently, where the where the citizens rise up and overthrow them. So well, if they can if they can control them by fear or legislation, or or monetarily, I mean I you know not to go way off base or crazy, but I would argue to say that the United States is currently in that position where it's it's we 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 definitely still maintain our freedom of speech, but now we get criticized. For mm-hmm. it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, you know I don't I don't mind you know intelligent criticism of my speech, you know, yeah. or things like that, you know, well informed or well like this discussion. Yeah. I, mean, I have no issue with this, but yeah, when it's Oh, you're just mean, and they they walk away. You know, then it's it's unhelpful. Well, dismissive doesn't work for anybody. Dismissive, yeah. Well said. Um, well, this this is the thing, though, is I would I would say though that part of the reason, and and this is going to reveal even more of my Catholic understanding of of what marriage is, is that um, intimately tied into the whole concept of marriage is the idea of children, the the procreation. Um, this is why, like for example, the, the Catholic Church, and, and this has been one of its more controversial stances, has been opposed to uh, contraception. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's been it's it's opposed to um, divorce uh, as far as just kind of uh, uh, in passing, not opposed to the idea of people separating for safety reasons and for things of that nature. Um, and that's why the church also has its stance as far as uh, same-sex relationships. Um, you know, because the the whole concept of children and procreation and the end of the the joy of a couple together is all coupled together in one shared experience. Um, so this, I mean, this is what makes the Catholic Church quite controversial, and that's why, unfortunately, I uh, you know I, I have so many things that I want to say, and so many ways to respond to these questions, and I, I could talk on this. I mean, I've, I've read I don't know probably ten books regarding this, and I've only scratched the surface, and. Um, and my teaching, that's why I rarely bring this up in homilies, because, you know, God bless the people in the pews. They give me about eight minutes before they start, you know, <laughs> nodding off or oh, nodding off, you know, checking yeah. their Twitter. Well, we've yeah. already lost all of our audience. This is oh, us three now. I know, that's why you should have brought in a priest. My gosh, I know how to put people to sleep like that. But I'm not doing it on Sundays. I'm doing it in the classroom where the kids are falling asleep. And, but there, it's awesome. I can make them do push-ups. It's fantastic. No, I, I think they can do push-ups? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, come on. Seriously, they're nodding off. I'll be like, hey, you know, Tommy, uh, 15 in the back, all right. And, and, and I'll keep teaching. And, then and you don't get any back. backlash from te- from parents? No, I, I've had so many parents encourage me on that. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I, I'm all for that, folks. I am for that. You know, I, you know, I should come to the church just so I can get a workout. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've been so tempted. Like, the, you know, the, the nine year old lady in the front row, hey, hey, quit not enough. Get back there and give me 20. You know, I haven't done a push up in 72 years. <laughs> well, better start now. Um, you, know, you can get down there and knock them out with her, too, and you get a little bit of a workout. There you go. Lead by example. Yeah. Yeah, you haven't seen me. I'm weak. <laughs> I, I have trouble benching a broom handle. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I, w- I want to come back a little bit here. I, um, I, I, would, I would ask the question, whose responsibility is it? Mm-hmm. Is it the government's or is it the church's to, to talk about morality? Or is it the people? Or is it the individuals? Or individual, yeah. Yeah, very good. Well, Whose responsibility is it? Not that well, I expect you to have 100% of an answer. I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> I'm, I'm throwing that out there to, to no. put that question out there. Um, I'll say, well, okay, uh, I'll say both, both and. Okay. The reason I say both and is, um, would you agree that our societal prohibition on murder of innocent people is a moral statement that it is wrong for us to kill innocent human beings. Would you say that that's a moral statement? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. Okay. Why should the government be involved in at least? At, let's just talk about that specific law. Why should the government be involved in that specific law or that that area of morality of murder? I would argue that because if it's not, then we will act as a populace. Right, and we'll take law, the law into our own hands, yeah. and um, so you have to have sort of a set, um, uh, you know, list of actions that will take place if these, if if, if you murder somebody, this is what's going to happen. Okay, yeah. why? I mean, I mean, what? Why? Why should the government? Because here comes the question. What I guess then? What is the purpose of a government? Yeah. No, I like this. I like this. This is good. Um, uh, I would say that we, as a people, uh, we crave laws to a degree. We we want limitations. We want boundaries. As children, we want our parents to give us boundaries. Um, I, I have a teenage daughter and a and a nine year old. And uh, God bless you. Oh man. <laughs> and while they have varying boundaries, I can see what happens when I don't punish them. And 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 it's. It's a level of they, they it's almost it almost creates a security where they feel, OK, I'm more secure because I know dad won't let me get to this point. And if I do, then he's going to kind of whack me back or, you know, take something away or whatever. Um, so I think to a degree, we as a society, we do crave law. We do crave boundaries. Um, and we don't want we don't want our we don't want things taken from us. We don't want people sure. to be killed. We don't want people to be taken from us. Right. Um, Just because what what you know what happens in in those moments, and, and I would say that the the purpose of a government, um, any any government, big, small, whatever, ought to be, and I, I use that term very clearly, ought <laughs> to uh, to be one that that helps the the flourishing of people, that that helps the success of people uh, kind of like the laws and the boundaries that you're putting for your children those are designed to help your children become hopefully the the best people they can become yeah. so um you know learning the idea of uh, of a, a healthy bedtime is you know an important thing for your flourishing of your children so that they can concentrate so that they can do well at school um so they can safely operate a car um but but and i and i've talked with ken about this off site too but i tell my nine-year-old she has to be in bed by eight o'clock but mm -hmm. i tell my 17 year old she needs to go to bed whenever she feels like it but right oh but now to the nine-year-old why father are you telling me that i have to go to bed at this hour but she can do whatever she wants well, and I would say that that's based on something, relatively speaking, I mean, relatively uh, scientific. Um, you know, it's based on the fact that she has reached a certain level of maturity um, where she can uh, make those decisions herself, whereas the nine-year-old doesn't have enough life experience at this point to know what a healthy bedtime is. So with that said, let me bring it all the way back to the beginning and say... <laughs> Could this be an example of God telling his chosen people at that time who were the equivalent of nine-year-olds, mm -hmm. don't do this specific thing? And maybe as a society, we have matured a bit over the hundreds of years or thousands of years or millions of years. Well, that, and that's where you'll get me to say that there are all kinds of other things that he told his people to do that I don't believe should have ever been appropriate at any time. Murdering, raping, mm -hmm. keep all the virgins for yourself. Okay. <laughs> I mean, spread that around. It's there, it's in the, it's in the right. book. Yeah. Well, in in this is well, there are certain ones. For example, I'm assuming at your house you have the prohibition on your children murdering others. Um, I, I mean, maybe it's an assumption. But, uh, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, then, and then how do we define raising, murder? Raising children of the corn or something. Well, they, you know, how do we define murder? Well, it, there's another question. You know, the definition on these terms. The That's so a different podcast. <laughs> All right. There's, gosh, are you keeping a list, by the way? This is awesome. Anyway. No, but I, but see, uh, so, I love these but, questions that Ken's asking because he, he, he's, ra he's raising the, the fundamental point, which, which I think where he and I agree, is there are things that are considered sinful. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether everybody agrees with them or not, it really doesn't matter. If, if you believe that God exists, then then you, you subscribe to, to it to a degree. If you don't believe that God exists, then you probably don't even believe in sin. So it, it's a whole other ball of wax. But nope. my, my, whole, my whole position is I, I, had a, I had a really good example was I don't personally believe 
that that God is punishing people per se or will punish people like with the whole hell thing. Uh, a lot of people are like, oh, okay, well, if you sin, you're going to go to hell. Yeah, that's true. If you believe that concept, I don't want to misspeak here, but, but the whole concept of God is sending you to hell for being a sinner is, is the thing that I think a lot of people get confused with. Um, I don't believe God sends anybody to hell. Well, and, and again, I'm going to say that you being a Christian, Father Nels being a Christian, um, you know, would probably tend to agree on a lot of those things. But, I mean, the point that I'm trying to make is that the majority of Americans do not feel this way. I don't know if that's true or not. That people go and burn for eternity. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't. I do not know what the actual percentage of Americans who do or don't believe that. I think. I think there's a frightening amount of Americans who feel that homosexuality is sinful, is wrong, and and to me that 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 suffocates me. Um, and. They, Maybe it's not a majority, but it's definitely a people with a loud voice. And that's, I think, where the majority of the problem comes into play, where you and I even started this whole thing, was I, I'm, I'm sick and tired of, of the people who are so vocal, who are so, God said this, and therefore I can, I can protest a marriage, and I can, I mean, let's, let's, let's just put it right out there. I could put a sign up that says, God hates fags. No. And to me, that is, I, I firmly believe that if Jesus came for the first time right now, he would treat those actions the exact same way he did when he walked into the temple and saw the tax collectors collecting money, and he'd be flipping tables and he'd be ripping signs up, because I think there's I a think whole... I think he'd be putting people through those tables. Right, uh, right? I think there's know. a whole level of, I think there's a whole level of God kind of coming from the point of, you're not getting it. And and what's frustrating to me as a believer who who loves God, who tries to have conversations with people um, who are homosexual, who have been beaten up sometimes physically, but for the most part spiritually and and in society for being different. And to me, I firmly believe that is that is so anti what Christ is about. And going back to what Ken said, why does this have to be the one thing that we can't get past? And as a Christian, I, I've gotten past it. I, I'll be honest, and, and I wasn't sure how I was going to say this, but I've gotten past it a long time ago. And I don't understand. Let me take a step back. I know that there are millions of Christians in the world who have gotten just as past it as I have. But I don't understand why we keep allowing <laughs> the morons with the television stations and the and the megaphones to to keep using what we hold dear as a justification to hate and to discriminate and to hold people underfoot. And to me, that is, I think it's just as evil as what they think homosexuality is. This, I, I think, you are spot on. <clears throat> I, I couldn't agree with you more um, on the on those statements. Uh, because this is where I think Christianity, I, mean, I shouldn't say Christianity, um, that's too broad of a term. Many Christians have failed miserably in Should their call. Should we just say American Southerners? Or, no, I'm just, <laughs> right, not going there. Not going there. Not going there. But where many, many Christians, no, you know, and I'll throw, I'll throw Catholics too, you know, that there are many Catholics too that have failed in this call to love their brothers and sisters, um, you know, whether they be, you know, gay or not or whatever. Um and, and this is something that is, um, has been talked about and, and put in, like, for example, I'll say in church documents that, um, unfortunately not a lot of people have paid attention to, that the necessity to continue to love, uh, people is, is a universal thing. Um, that doesn't mean necessarily an acceptance of certain actions, but the person needs to be loved. And that's that's one of my one of my big things for for myself when I'm teaching this because I teach morality to sophomores at our at our high school. Yeah, try and teach high school sophomores morality if you want a challenge. Oh God, wow. it's like banging your head against the wall. It only feels good when you stop. Um, but it's it's well, it's, some would argue that scientifically, a person at that age range, that age range doesn't 
possess the executive function ability in their brain yet because that part isn't developed yet. So trying to teach morality to somebody at that age range is probably a, a, an exercise in futility. And I believe that we're ingrained with a certain level of morality. So, I mean, it's, well, what, there's well, millions of Christians who would agree with that. Yeah, no. Yeah. And, well, that's the thing is, I, and gosh, oh my gosh, yes, it's so, all right, anyway, I, I have so many things. Like, I know, I know, and, and, so, and, and that's it, fine, that, that's, that's what we're here for, man, you know? for, Anyway, um, no, no, but, but I would say that that's when a new level of moral awakening happens, at least that's what I've observed. No, obviously it's not, it's different for every person as to when they reach certain waypoints in as far as our mental capacities and growth. But I, it's been my observation that from the beginning of the sophomore year to the end of the sophomore year, those those students that I have are very different people. Uh, it's it's really amazing to watch that, that maturation happen. Uh, that by the end, um, they, they can have those conversations. And it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Um, but I guess, you know, to, to my main point is when I come up to the point where we're teaching in the school, the, the church is teaching on sexual ethics. Um, one of the things that I drill home with them is that at least the, the Catholic perspective um, and what God teaches is, is that we cannot, we cannot at all um, be, be mean to people because of their tendencies or even, dare I say, their choices that they've made. And so one of the questions I always have on one of my exams is, what does the Catholic Church teach about people who, who are homosexual? What does the Catholic Church teach? Not what does it teach about the actions, but what does it teach about the people? And I give the kids a heads up, because we spend a lot of time talking about that, that just because we disagree with the action does not mean that we hate the person or give us any permission to, as you were talking about those signs. I mean, I, I would say Jesus would show up and see those signs and, you know, God doesn't hate bags. He hates your sign is what he'd say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but why do we and, prohibit the, we, we don't hate, but we prohibit their, their happiness to a degree. Like, and, no, and I think, I, think I want to go back to what you were saying earlier. You were talking about, you were, you were sort of going down the line that, uh, you know, marriage is instituted by governments I believe is what you were trying to say that uh, to sort of encourage flourishment, uh, procreation. Uh, it doesn't um, institute it, but it gives um, it gives certain benefits to marital relationships. It promotes it through right. it promotes, promotes it, yeah. But but we, we got you know this affects three to ten percent of our population, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Three to ten percent of our population are homosexual. Um, who aren't going to be able to procreate on their own. Mm -hmm. Luckily, with the advent of science and mm -hmm. scientific achievement, you know, I was hoping if I can attest to this, we have things like IVF, mm -hmm. where a man and a man can actually I really like sort that. of procreate. I really, no, I really like they, that. They can have a child, mm -hmm. and they can raise that mm -hmm. child, and this happens all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah, I really like that, and I'm glad that you brought that up, and I was hoping you would, because that falls under the thing that I was talking about earlier, which is that wasn't a scientific possibility 4,000 years ago, 8,000 years ago. It just wasn't. We did not but have why? Technology. Why did we have to? Why couldn't, you know what I'm saying? Why did this God who created all things, supposedly, he created this whole ecosystem that we live and thrive in that is so intricate to the point that where, you know, if the mosquitoes die out, then the bats don't have yeah. to eat, and then the plants don't get pollinated, and this happens, and that happens, and everything's all interconnected so perfectly. Um, our bodies, the way that they work, the way that they grow, um, you know, the optic nerve, you know, when you look at the way that that develops in child, you know, when a fetus is developing in a mother's womb, you see that the, the optic nerve starts in the brain and one starts at the eyeball and they meet these thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of wires, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term, synapses meet perfectly and line up so that we can have sight. And he couldn't, he could do all of these things and make this world so intricate, but he couldn't tell us that we needed to wash our hands before we eat. Or well, I think what you're describing no, I think to reduce everything. You know, no, no, it's it's good. I think what you're describing. We couldn't have a more concise, clear. Hey, this is this is what you guys need to do. Period. Slavery's wrong. 
It's wrong to kill other human beings. It's wrong to treat other human beings in this way, period. But we have these, at this point, slavery is okay, and oh, now it's not okay. And Do you, know, do you understand? It, I this do. It's okay to treat women, you know, women should be silent and uh, be subservient to their husbands. And, well, now that's changed. Why? Maybe in your marriage. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, listen. He's I, kidding, honey. <laughs> I guess I'm never going to get invited over. Um, <laughs> no, but, you know, it's. I think what you've just described is the very definition of free will. And, uh, yeah, God is, again, we have to go from the assumption that I believe that God is real. So when I speak about God, I'm coming from that belief structure. In my mind, God could have kept perfect order to everything. Um, and then we would call him a controlling, bitter God. Uh, but free will is the key. I mean, and, and what? Not if he told us all to be happy and not hurt. But that's not. Other, but that's not, not what he said. Why don't, is that such well, a bad thing? We'll come, why back, is that? come back to this one then. Okay. Um, what What is happiness? It's defined differently by different people. I think. Then, then how can you even tell me God wants us to be happy if it's defined differently? Or how, how can you say we should try that's to be really well, if it's defined differently? You know, then how can we even have a discussion about it? We have to have some shared definition of Well, happiness. because I know what I feel when you say the word happy, and okay. you know what you feel when I use the word happy, mm -hmm. and so and those could be two completely different things. Maybe we have, you know, maybe our eyes work differently, and when I look up at the sky and I see blue sky, you're really seeing green, but because you've been told your whole life that it's blue... But... You say there's that a whole blue. scientific sure. belief me, on that, dude. Yeah, but tell me this, though. Because of our scientific understandings and everything, even if my brain interprets it as green, yours interprets it as blue, and we both call it blue, are we not looking at the exact same wavelength that is reflected off of the atmosphere that's coming into our eyes? Even if we interpret it differently, there is something objective that we can measure, wavelength, that is shared. So when we talk about light, you know, yeah, we're talking about how our brains interpret it, but we are at minimum talking about a, 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 an objective, measurable wavelength yep. that's felt there. That, yes, we've given this wavelength, you know, spectrum uh, blue, and this one red, and this one green, but it's at, at minimum the thing that we talk about, in essence, is the, the wavelength that's there, scientifically speaking. But we're talking about, you're talking about something that is, uh, can be measured Versus mm -hmm. a feeling that that people have, and well, how we, because this. and and just be, and I would say that just because we don't have the technology to, to measure those feelings at this point doesn't mean it doesn't, doesn't mean that we won't yeah. at some point. Sure. And I believe that you know in those absences of knowledge, we shouldn't just fill that with well then it's God. Uh, well, okay, I'm that's going fair. Off on a different. You know, tangent. But. That's totally fair. That's totally fair. And I know that there's a lot of atheists who feel that way. And I and I almost subscribe to that because over the years we we've learned. So I would I would venture to say what would be better to say instead of saying it's just God. Um, I mean I think there's merit to that to a degree as far as just trusting. But at the same time, like like a parent when the parent says don't touch the stove because I said so, just trusting. But at the same time, I think it might be a, a smarter thing to say instead of saying it's just God, but say. Well, we'll find out, or hopefully we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's just as just as valid. I don't know. I'm okay with it, and I, <laughs> I wish more people would be okay with it. And we talk, we hit on this in the last podcast that you know, in this country, you have to pick a you have yeah. to pick a side for some reason. And I think that boils it's, back it's down okay to fear. just say I don't know. I don't know at this point. Yeah, I'm waiting for more evidence. I think that boils back down to fear. Is we have such a desperate need to know. A desperate need to say, this is what it is, so I can understand why the world is spinning and what, you know what I mean? Right. I want to go back to, because I almost got there. We were talking about the human flourishing and, and procreation and, and those kinds of things. Yeah. And I said, you know, this affects 3 to 10% of our population. Mm -hmm. Well, there are those people that we allow to get married that never intend to procreate, mm -hmm. can't procreate, mm -hmm. and, you know, if, if, that's, the, if that's what we're going to base our... And we're going to allow this because they're because of their ability to procreate. We should allow. We should have marriage only because we're able to procreate. Mm -hmm. Well, then, you know, my grandmother-in-law is a widow. Mm -hmm. She's in her eighties. Mm -hmm. She could potentially meet a man. They could fall in love. They could want to get married. I would bet. 
a lot of money. I'd be willing to bet a lot of money on it. And I think you would be too. That they're not going to intend to procreate. They may commit the act that could cause that, but they're not going to procreate. So should we prohibit them from? As as well as should we prohibit the, you know, millions of Americans that are married and don't have kids? Well, I uh, you know a, a totally legit question. Um, I guess the okay, rewinding just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, when a little bit more, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so so when the um, so when we talk about marriage, as far as the the whole concept of of procreation being intimately tied into the whole concept of it, that's part of the reason why the government even gets involved in, if you will, regulating or having some say in what um, what marriage is. Because the government doesn't get involved in friendships. The, the, the government does not tell me who my friends are, mm-hmm. who they can be, who not they can't be. Not yet. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, fair enough. But, you know, it's interesting because the more intimate that something like that becomes, a relationship, because the government does regulate uh, business relationships. You know, these these two businesses are allowed to get together. Um, the the um, they'll regulate certain types of contracts that are formed between businesses, but uh, and then partnerships and law firms, etc. But then the more the more intimate that a relationship becomes, the less regulation there is from our government. Government doesn't tell me who um, is my best friend, or I don't have to go get legal recognition for my best friend, Father John, to be my best friend. As a matter of fact, the government stays very far away from that, which I think is a fantastic thing. Um, But the government has become involved in this thing called marriage. And the way that they become involved in it is through tax breaks. I mean, that's the primary thing. But for you who are married, um, what, what are the other legal benefits to being married uh, that, that you know of, besides besides the the marriage tax. ownership of property um insurance um if you break up you get you get to split it 50. yeah depending on <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. i mean but would you say that's a benefit i mean that's a legal consequence but well if um, we're just talking legally i say yeah those are those are benefits of, but i would say okay. that but i would say but i would argue that I would have gotten married even if I didn't have those tax breaks, mm-hmm. and I'm pretty sure that there are millions of other Americans that would agree with me. Yeah, so. no, and, and that's and that's kind of my my first one of my points. I, I have so many. Gosh, um, not not horns on my head, but you know, uh, <laughs> but points in general um, is that um, the I've the, got the, horns. <laughs> we'll we'll worry about those, all right. I brought my holy water. We can maybe get right, rid of them. Sweet. Um, but oh my. <laughs> yeah, the first podcast exorcism. Um, so they, uh, but that's that's the thing is that to say that those people are prohibited from marriage is, I think, a, a, a false understanding. They're prohibited from getting the tax breaks of being married. Because correct me if I'm wrong, and I, I, I might be, I'm not a legal expert, um, but people can sign documents to have shared property even if they are not legally married. Yeah, so and then, I think in some states, you know, if, if a man and a woman live together yeah. for long enough. Yeah. Common law. Marriage. Common law. Yeah. Common law. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, so one need not uh, have a piece of paper that says you're married, even to have anything, with the exception. The only one that the government does. Correct. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I'm, I'm not a legal expert either. So. Okay. Well, as far as, as far <laughs> I'm pretty as, good. I'm pretty good. Yeah. No, he's all right. <laughs> um, as far as I know, the the main thing is the the so-called uh, marriage tax break. Um, so the the only thing that the government really is doing with that is setting up, okay, in the event that there's a breakup of this relationship, is they take care of some of that legal stuff for you by having it on record that the two of you have agreed to share ownership unless you state otherwise in a legal document. And we will give you a little bit of a tax break um, when you're filing jointly. Um, so the like you said, though, Ken, um, that you would still have gotten married even if the government gave you no tax breaks because mm-hmm. your marriage to get married is not based upon the civil government saying, hey, here's a, here's a sheet of paper. It's a personal commitment of one person to another. Right. Okay. So with with that concept kind of in play, the, the question has to be then, why did the government get in the business of giving out money or, you know, not taking as much money uh, for married couples versus best friends. Why can myself and Father John not just say, hey, 
Uh, we're good buddies. We vacation together. Uh, we hang out. We, we grab uh, a lot of White Castle together. Yep. A lot of White Castle. Mm. Um, oh, and, uh, disgusting. You guys both disgust. I, <laughs> David, you... Oh, it's all around me, dude. <laughs> I live less than two miles from a White Castle. Oh, what a gift. No, no, no. No, it's good until you've eaten it, and then it, it's the gift that oh. keeps on giving. Oh, yeah, exactly. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely disgusting. This yeah. podcast is clearly not sponsored by White Castle. <laughs> yeah, I would do that. Anyway, I should start up one. Anyway. Um, yeah. So so then the question would be, you know, with if the government's not going to give me a tax break for having a good friend, Father John, why is the government interested in giving tax breaks, or why has it historically been in, in, in promoting marital type of relationships? If, if marriage is defined simply as two friends hanging out together, um, what? why would the government even care about that? Because the government doesn't care about our friendships. And this comes back to that question of what is marriage. And so I, I would argue, and I might be wrong, but you know, I'll, I'll make the case that mm-hmm. the reason the government got involved in that is because of the end of both the happiness of the couple and the procreation of children combined together because – you know, the, the, the stable relationship of that man and woman creates the environment for rearing children, for designing that. Now, in the case of, you know, great aunt Edna, who's, you know, 96 and at the nursing home and, mm-hmm. and things like that, her getting married. No, um, in all probability, she's not going to be um, uh, bearing any children. Right. Um, but that doesn't mean, though, that that relationship that she's formed with, you know, with Ed at the uh, at the nursing home is not still... Ed. I know what point is you dog. <laughs> Poor guy. Definitely. Why poor guy? He's out to get action. I don't know. <laughs> so, oh, okay. Just a, a funny story. Um, just a side. So you know, I help, I'm at a. I was at a parish and I was helping out the nursing home and I do mass at the nursing home. And uh, at the end of mass, I always like to give the people at the nursing home just a little update on the news and things and what's going on and. So I said, uh, you know, it's going to be really cold tonight. Uh, so make sure you, uh, make sure you stay warm tonight. Make sure you put an extra blanket on the bed. And this old guy in the back yells out. He goes, ah, blanket. I prefer the company of a woman. <laughs> Man, he knows what he wants. Yeah, well, I said to him, I said, well, Ed, for, Ed, I'll call him Ed. Well, Ed, for your sake, uh, that might be a possibility. But for me, as a priest, uh, I'll go with the blanket. <laughs> We we definitely have to have Father Snell's back in the future to talk about you know that that whole uh, celibacy thing too because that's a hot button one for me. But anyway, uh, it's so funny how many people are concerned about my celibacy. <laughs> <laughs> How's your life going? No, um, yeah, so, um, but okay. So back to the the whole idea of procreation. You know, so these two, you know, Edna and Ed at the at the nursing home. Their relationship, while it, well, it's probably you know you know in all reality not going to bring about children. It still is oriented towards the truth of what, uh, what certainly I understand marriage to be. Um, you know, even though it, just in the same way that every sexual act between uh, uh, a young couple is not going to bring about a child, um, it still is pointing towards the truth of what the sexual act in marriage is all about. Um, now, if if marriage, if we're going to change the definition of marriage to be just two two people who care deeply about each other and are in essence best friends mm-hmm. um then then i would say the government wouldn't have any reason for being involved in it if if that's the definition we're going with. but if marriage is that if you will a, a cell of society in which children are brought about and then reared and prepared and taught the the basic essentials that a parent can teach better to their children than a government regulation camp can. But two two men can't do that. Well, in, in, in two men can't go to an IVF clinic, have a surrogate, have a child, hmm. and then teach their children the same values and morals that you know that you and I have. That I'm pretty share. sure that's happening right now, anyway, isn't it? I, I, oh no, that's it, what I'm, I'm just I'm, it is happening, and you know I guess the the. The question in, in, in those cases is, and this, this is maybe another podcast in it, um, are there differences between men and women? Do, does masculinity bring something to society that femininity does not mm-hmm. and that can't be replicated by masculinity right? that femi- and, or that can't be replicated by femininity and vice versa? 
do women, by their very nature of being a woman, bring something unique and special to society that can't be simply replicated by a guy thinking in a different way? Um, are there those? And, you know, I would say most universities would acknowledge yes, uh, because they'll have women's studies departments. Mm -hmm. And um, no matter how feminine a man may feel, um, I know I know some men that are far more feminine than most women. Sure, I sure. Oh, well, hey, yeah. Well, especially in the wrestling business, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> or around the wrestling business. Yeah, around, yeah. And uh, but but it's one of these. But is there something unique about women that we as men simply can't replicate, or are the genders, uh, by their very nature, just simply interchangeable and irrelevant to our society? Uh, you know, and, and that's and that's a different discussion. I I wholly admit, but I, yeah. I would say not unrelated. So I, I'm not saying that that um, you know two men or two women who are rearing a child can't do a, a very good job of that uh, by any means. But I I would I would like to have that discussion before I you know before I just declare any. But you would you would agree that there are tons of people who are very outspoken who do feel that way. Oh yeah. Oh, without a doubt. Um, but that's where that's where too, and this is the element. I think what you were getting at too um, is is like, okay, you can have the truth, and that's awesome, great, good for you. But do you share it in a capacity of love? Right. You know, do you do you share it in such a way where I keep the the individual with whom I'm speaking in in my eyes, rather than just blindly throwing the truth around like a sledgehammer? And, and, you know, and just knocking over whoever and whatever gets in the way of it. Hope you can catch it. Um, and that's and that's the element of Christianity that's essential to Christian message. And here's where we're going to get as controversial as we needed to. <laughs> All right. I'm going to ask the big question. Is the truth, is homosexuality right or wrong? And that is where the biggest debate happens. Now I'm just gonna, I'm gonna preface it with this, uh, not to preface I already said it, but <laughs> but but here's the thing. When I was a younger guy, I was probably about 12 years old. My parents had a, a friend who were or a gay couple. Um, I, I live in Chicago land, very very common here. Um, I loved them. They were great neighbors. They were great people. Um, they individually were were wonderful guys. I, I I hung out with them. We you know we'd go to ball games. We 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 talk and and just I was at a very formative age where we would just talk about all different stuff and it was so cool. And when they were that, trying to indoctrinate. Oh well, yeah, they were trying to turn me. I say <laughs> no, but um, but no. On a serious note, whenever a conversation about faith came up, I noticed they would shut down, and that would break my heart because I realized they they've been so just programmed to not even discuss it because, you know, and I respect that they had enough consideration for me not to want to offend me, but I, I it's one of those, I don't, I don't see them anymore because they were my, my, my parents' friends, we moved, and I, I, I've always wanted to have at least had another conversation with them just, just to say, you know, you wouldn't have offended me, let's talk, you know what I mean? Yeah. And and I don't have that opportunity, and I think that's probably driving why I want to do this, is because there is love there. And when I say I love them, it didn't mean I wanted to have sex with them. It was just I loved them, and they were great people, and I wanted them in my life. And it's and, and it was just a progression that I saw over the years, being a teenager, becoming in my mid twenties and in my early thirties, watching as other Christians would condemn just on a knee-jerk reaction. And so many of them without even knowing homosexual people. And to me, that was so atrocious. And so I really want to boil down to it. Is it fair to say that being gay is wrong, right, or I don't know? Well... And I think you're you're asking the, the right question. The uh, being gay, as you as you put it, um, does not make a person evil, plain and simple. <clears throat> the because um, that's one thing that uh, that is really important to make that distinction. That's why, like I mentioned on my test, you know, for my test for my students is what does the church teach about people who are homosexual? 
And the fact of the matter is they are still loved by God. They are people worthy of dignity and respect, people that we I need to be ready to lay down my life for. And they are loved by God just as I am loved by God. And um, no, it, it does not make the person evil at all. And that's where I take a lot of issue with many Christians who say those types of things, like you were saying, some of the other people around um, around your neighbors would say those types of things. And no, um, the, the church will say that uh, the homosexual sexual activities are wrong or sinful, um, just as the church will say that uh, sex before marriage for a heterosexual couple is wrong and immoral, uh, just as the church will say that, um, you know, the, the killing of innocent people is, is wrong. But, but let's, it, not equate it, let's not equate it to something. I, 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 I'm on your wavelength of sin is sin. I get that. Okay. Uh, but I but I know that a lot of people don't have that understanding. So sure. I'm sure Ken goes. Um, I don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I'm sure that Ken can't understand that in the eyes of God, somebody murdering somebody is no different than somebody stealing a candy bar from a grocery store. Well, that that's one thing in the Catholic faith. They would be um, not as far as like they're not in a different category. They're they're all sin, but there's different degrees. Of doesn't, of sin. didn't Jesus at one point say that like? Murdering someone would carry the same, I guess, weight in heaven that uh, getting angry at your brother would, or something to that effect. Uh, yeah, the, the passage is that um, you. He says you have heard it said that uh, you, you shall not commit murder. I say to you, whoever holds anger in his heart against his brother is already guilty of murder. Yeah. Now it doesn't say holds the same weight. Okay. But it, he he is already guilty of, and that's just a quick aside. Um, that's where the whole like when. When I'm helping people make an examination to prepare for confession, for example, um, anger, I'll, put, I'll use the Ten Commandments as like, a, as like kind of headings, but I'll put different sins underneath those because they're related to it. So I'm, I'll be like, are you angry? Are you holding anger in your heart against somebody intentionally? Um, that falls under the category of murder. Um, you know, do you, do you allow yourself to, to get road rage? It falls under the category. But... The gravity of the sin does fluctuate depending. Like you mentioned, stealing a candy bar versus, let's say, um, you know, stealing, you know, somebody's medication that they need to live. You mm -hmm. know, um, we'll have different capacity. See, as a as a as, as, go ahead. Maybe as a Protestant, this is where I'm going to come in and say, uh, in my mind, and I could be wrong, but in my mind, I feel as far as God is concerned, it is exactly the same because God is. I I look at sin on a very literal term. Mm -hmm. Sin is, uh, if, if, I, if I could describe it as um, uh, a tangible entity, it's, it's something that, um, if God is perfection, he is literally without sin. Therefore, to introduce sin to it, it would contaminate everything. He, 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 it, just, it just cannot work. Scientifically, it cannot work. Um, a great example I've, I've heard was you could have a glass of water. Right. I mean, you can have a clean glass of water and someone comes along and drops a small piece of just crap or dirt or whatever into it. Do you drink it? No. Even though 99 percent of that glass contained clean water, one percent of that crap contaminated the entire glass. And that's that's kind of how I look at sin. And I honestly believe and I know that I have a lot of Christians who disagree with me, but I think just the concept of sin itself begs to defend it, that when Jesus took the sin of all of mankind on the cross, because I believe that. Um, he at that moment he was no he he was no different than any thief. He was no different than any pedophile. He was no different than I, I mean he literally became all he took all of our sins. That's how I believe, and that encompasses all of it. And and the whole point that the whole fact of him sacrificing his perfect life for our sins literally makes almost this entire discussion moot for the for the sake of it doesn't matter anymore all of all of our sinful nature god before christ couldn't even look at us but because of christ and because he paid that now he doesn't see our sin he sees christ who paid for that sin does that make sense it makes sense. I um, could be way off base. This is just a personal well, feeling, a personal yeah, no, thing that I've gone with. Yeah, fair enough. I, I, 
to respond to that one, not to go down that road too far, because that's yet another podcast. I was, <laughs> well, no, 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 but I, I just, just because I, I, you call, I, I, call the act of homosexual sex sin. No, I, I was going to say, like, I, I find that whole idea of that vicarious redemption to be immoral in itself. One person cannot pay the consequences or pay the price for everybody's wrongdoings. None of us could, absolutely. And I don't believe that, and I don't believe that, I personally don't believe that, you know, Jesus Christ doing the same or, or saying that he's doing the same takes care of, you know, I, if, if somebody murders one of my family members, I'm not going to be cool if Father Nell says, hey, you know what, I'll take his place on the gallows or I'll take his place in the chair yeah, yeah. or I'll, you know, I'll go to jail for him and that guy goes free. No, I'm not going to be happy with that. So I don't that, understand why we'd be happy with it. Yeah, you'd have to work under the assumption that, that you believe in sin, though. Because if you don't believe that Jesus did that, if you don't believe that God exists, then you really have no reason to believe in sin. Well, I don't believe in sin. I just believe that so, people do things. Some people do good things, some people do bad things, and some people do both. So that's not, that's, both. that's not even an issue, then, because it really isn't about that. I, what I'm saying is that I do believe uh, in sin, and I do believe in God, I do believe in hell, I do believe in heaven, I do believe that Jesus was the Son of God, all that stuff. I say all that to say this. You're not calling homosexual sex a sin, because you don't believe in sin. Right. So therefore, why, why even worry about it? Do you know what I mean? You, and you don't. You don't. But for... for well, I worried, the thing that I worry about is that, you know, people who don't agree with me are affecting the lives of, yeah, you know. Mm-hmm. And that shakes your morality. That shakes something inside of you that says that seems wrong. Yes. And I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Morality, I guess. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think what the real issue here is, and, I, and, I'll, and I'm, I'm willing to bet that Father Nels would agree with me, is that the issue really isn't with you. The issue really isn't with homosexual people. The issue is within the church. It's within Christianity. It's within people of faith who are labeling these things because they, they really need to take an inward look on how they're dealing with, and I don't mean to say they, I mean me too. We really need to take an inward look on how we're dealing with this thing because in reality, it's other people. And what business do we really have even thinking too much about what kind of sin that we describe as sin on, of another well, person. Do you know what I mean? The uh, So it, you were talking earlier about your friends, mm-hmm. the, the two women that are going to be married. Mm-hmm. Shouldn't we encourage people to, you know, uh, go down that path to, you know, whatever they're contributing to society, they're good citizens, they're uh, promoting good values, good morals, um, even though you may disagree with, you know, one particular yeah. moral that they keep. You know, when you, and I say that because I look around the country and I see all kinds of people that are permitted to be married who, in my opinion, have no business being married. Like, hmm. you look at the divorce rate. Look at people yeah. who are married and divorced four or five times. Yeah, yeah. Um. No, you know it's a it's a you know a very healthy assessment I think, and that's um and that's one of the things where you know the the fullness in I'll go full on Catholic here um I I would argue that what at least the Catholic Church holds to be marriage was lost all the way back in 1930, um because what what happened in 1930 was the the moral discussion of contraception began in uh, amongst the Anglicans at the Lambeth Conference. It's called when all the Anglican bishops would get together and discuss it. Prior to that, prior to 1930, every every uh, denomination of Christianity prohibited contraception because they saw that intimate connection between procreation and marriage and in that lifelong covenant as being all part of the package deal of what marriage is. Uh-huh. Um, so in 1930 was the Lambeth Conference was the first time that the Anglican bishops allowed for in very particular usage the, the use of contraception, which I, I would make the case, and, and there's quite a few Catholic theologians who will agree with me. Some will disagree, but uh, 
that that's when the beginning of the changing and the redefinition of marriage came about. And so as, as a Catholic, um, you know, the, the issue I, I would say is I, I'm not at all surprised that we've gotten to where we are as far as the changing of the definition of marriage uh, in, in, in legal terms, because I would say mentally the change in the definition of marriage began back in 1930 when we started um, saying that the idea of procreation, the idea of all these things tied together, was not a part of what marriage is. That, it, that it's, in essence, a, a very deep personal friendship that's there. So now, when it comes to, like, for example, my, my friends, you know, they, they are. They're, they're, they're wonderful people. Um, they're very courteous, very kind. They do a lot of things for their society. I disagree with them, obviously, on that one particular choice. Um, and But I think these types of things do matter, and that's why I don't mind discussing them with people. I don't mm -hmm. mind discussing them. And, uh, and let me just stop you. I just, I just want to get a little hot here for a minute. Um, when you say you, you don't agree with their choice, do you mean just their sexual act? Uh, as far well, as... The idea oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, um, the, the sexual activity, yeah. Cause, okay. So you don't care if they live together, you don't care if they're roommates, you don't care if they vacation together, you don't care if they want to conduct business together, you, you don't, don't care. care if they're attracted to each other. Even, you know, even that, I mean, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a careful line to walk, but, but yeah, I mean, who, who cares if they, if they vacation? I mean, they, you know, it, it, the, the issue, morally speaking, would be on the level of sexuality. Um, and sexual practice, I'm sorry, I should... I should so, so, so and, and the point that Ken brought up, so it's more of the action of acting upon their attraction towards each other. Right, well, it, I'm glad you bring that up, because <laughs> uh, that's another thing that, that is very, very much differentiated in, in Catholic moral teaching regarding this, that there's, if you will, three different things that are at play that, unfortunately, in our conversation get conflated together. Mm -hmm. There's the person, there's the attraction... And then there, thirdly, there's the action. So people are always good. Even, the, even after sin, the Catholic teaching understanding would be, while we're severely flawed because of original sin, we're still, in essence, good. Uh, it's kind of like if you have a Ferrari, if it's got a big scratch on it, but you still say, hey, do you want this Ferrari? Yeah, I'll take it. I'll buff the scratch out later. Mm -hmm. um, and the attraction. Uh, people have attractions, if you will, to all kinds of different activities throughout the day. Um, I, I, you know, driving down the road, I have, if you will, I loosely use the term, the attraction to speeding. You know, I mean, it, yeah, I'm like, hey, I want to speed. Or, um, I have the attraction to punching someone, uh, not Ken, because he's <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I love hearing that there's a priest out there who, who struggles with wanting to punch people. I, you know, I, 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 am, I am just as human as everyone else. And uh, Do you go to confession after you uh, have these? <laughs> no, no. That's, that's, I'm glad you asked that. I'm glad you asked that. Because to have the attraction to doing something is is not in and of itself a sin. But Jesus said, even if you look at a woman and think about her, if you lust that, after a woman in your heart, no, you it was think another man's sin. wife. Yes, yes, boom, exactly. If you think, notice there's there's the there in there is the activity, the the free will. We were talking about free will earlier. I've chosen to use my free will to lust. Now, if I have an inclination. You know, which as a guy, I, I will not deny that I still find women attractive, you know. So you're walking along and, you know, it's really hot during the summer and too. And, the, you know, when women are working, you know, it's like, oh, OK. Um, you know, I don't deny that. But the thing is, do I engage my free will to meditate, if you will, and to, to let that image, you know, take root in my mind and then have these fantasies in my mind? Then I've engaged my free will. Then sin would come into play. Uh, a lesser degree, if I would have acted on them, uh, you know, for the Catholic understanding, um, which, uh, you know. See, and I'm on the opposite side where, where Ken was trying to go with it, which is, I, I believe that Jesus was saying, and, and, to, and to clarify, he was speaking about other men's wives. He was saying, if you even think of your neighbor's wife, you've already committed adultery in your heart. I, 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 and and I, I, the way I look at that is Jesus saying, nobody is going to be good at this. Nobody is going to be perfect at this. Even you, you can't say, well, I, I haven't slept with my neighbor's wife, so therefore I'm not a sinner. And Jesus is saying, no, if you even think about doing her, right. you're just as bad. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, 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 again, you and I are coming from different perspectives, but I think that's where I look at that as Jesus saying, look, nobody is going to be able to pull this off perfectly. Is even if you think of having sex with another person's wife, you're just as guilty as, as acting on it. 
I, I'll, I'll agree with you there. The, the, I'll just throw this out there. Um, in the, I believe and, and for the record, there are plenty of friends of mine wives who I have unfortunately thought of having sex with, but that's <laughs> me just coming clean. All right. <laughs> if you're a Catholic, I'd give you absolution. Um, the, uh, uh, but actually, the, the idea of different degrees of sin is actually, that one is very scripturally based uh, with James, where he talks about there's sin which, I call, which is deadly, and there's sin which is non-deadly. So he even creates two categories, if you will. Of sin, mm. um, but but that's that you know we that, that's another podcast. Yeah, but, I think that more <laughs> that falls under the whole you know not so much eternity, but more on you know there's certain things that God doesn't want you to do, not because it's it separates you from Him, but it's more of if you do this, the the repercussions on Earth could be pretty terrible. I see. Okay. You know, so maybe I'm not saying God does or doesn't want you to um, to to steal, but if you do get caught stealing, you could end up imprisoned or punished or murdered or you know what I mean and, sure. and it could be something to be and I, I again I could totally be off base on this I'm right. just going on what I've read and what I've kind of evolved in my own thoughts over the years but I, I, I kind of go with the mindset that God is saying don't do these things because you know I'm not going to punish you but man may but someone else may yeah you know what I mean like if you yeah. steer clear of these certain things you may not have to deal with the linear repercussions that tend to happen on earth Okay. At the hands uh, of other men. All right. That's an, not how I've, not how I've ever heard it interpreted, but that's. Um, and again, guess, I'm no, know, I'm no preacher, so <laughs> who knows? Well, it's, you know, but I, I guess back to those, you know, to the what what Kim was saying, asking about the, you know, the the friends, and as far as them getting married, and, and that, you know, the the, you know, the 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 real church's teaching is that um, that. And I think this is really important for my friends to understand and for most people to understand. As, as human beings, though, we still need friendships. We, st- we are social beings. We still need relationships. I, as a celibate priest, you know, am living this life where I, you know, I'm, I'm not in a sexual relationship with any woman or man or anybody. And it's, um, and it's, it, but I still need friendships. I still need these deep type of sharing that I can do. And honestly, I think that's what people are longing for. So that's why there's, there's actually a website that I'll make a, a little plug for that I read rather regularly called spiritualfriendship.org. And what it is, is it's actually, I believe it's about 10 different contributors on this blog that are all people who are gay or lesbian and all hold to the church's teaching as to what marriage and sexuality is all about. And so what they continuously do is they're, you know, and one of the writers, she's been featured in um, the New York Times, and uh, the, most of them have written some books and give these talks about it. What they talk about, though, is how do they still, as humans, this need for intimacy, this need for friendship, how do they live that out while still holding to what the church teaches about the sexual practices? And, and how do they how do they do this? And they do a beautiful job of talking about, you know, their own personal struggles with that but also how they see the church's teaching as far as what marriage and sexuality is for as, as, a, as a beautiful fulfillment still. Um, and so they, they're kind of an anomaly in, in the world as far as how the world views them. And they say, wait, wait, so you're supporting the church's teaching, yet you are fully experiencing, you know, the, the same-sex attractions that anybody does. And, and they... They continuously and clearly defend the church's teaching as to why. But I like also they put out some good challenges to, you know, the, the clergy and many Catholics out there of, okay, how can you articulate this better so that you don't, A, sound hateful because the church's teaching isn't hateful. And how can you also support us in living spiritual friendship in, in the ways that we need to as human beings? It may not be hateful today, but wouldn't you say that in the past it has been? I mean, you look at the. I, I would so I would go so far as to say that, uh, in defense of faith, that it it has been presented by people who have hatred in their heart, and it, by a vast majority of people. Well, right? the ones who are, have the loudest voice. The loudest. We, we've talked yeah. about that. Yeah. And the most power. Unfortunately, yeah. Economically, you mean? Economically, I mean physically. I mean, uh, I'm a big dude. I can. I'll happily have a conversation with somebody who wants to oppose me. <laughs> right, but uh, you know. Well, no, and you're, you're, I think you're right. Is that it's it, the the teaching on it has has failed to take heart in a lot of people's 
in, in a lot of in, in a lot of people's lives to to actually say, okay, um, I'm, I might disagree with this, but I still have to love that person. You know, I mean, I, you know, there are people too that uh, that I have friends who are who are living together before marriage. Yeah, do I still love them? Yeah, I do. Do I disagree with their decision? Yeah, I do. Um, okay, you know, you love them. You disagree with them. Mm -hmm. Why do we prohibit them from? Why do we make why do laws? We, why do we make laws to prohibit them from achieving the same happiness? That's what I'm getting at. We'll get, we'll get, I know we keep going back. Right. And, you know, right. No, no, right. no, no. That's that's exactly what I wanted us to touch on. Yeah. Well, and I guess that would be the the question as far as uh, that whole concept of prohibited, permitted, promoted. I mean, the right now it's. I mean, in many places it's prohibited. No. Yeah, well, well, that's what we talked about, was the Defense of Marriage Act. Oh, oh the, where, the where it seems, and, and again, it was like, as you had mentioned before we, we stopped this, in fact, you had mentioned that uh, you would argue that no one was really stopping anyone uh, from, from I, I would say, getting married, uh, or at least choosing to live together and things like that. And I, and I brought up, well, the Defense of Marriage Act seems almost like... Um, legislation that was designed to literally go out of its way to exclude a specific group of people. And to me, I can understand how offensive that would be perceived. Yeah, one, I, I, I certainly don't deny that. I, unfortunately, I don't know the, the actual wording of the Defense of Marriage Act um, off, off the top. All that matters is that they go out of their way to specify that it, um, the definition of marriage is between a man and a woman. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I, I certainly you know, un understand um, in, in the, the, the sympathy way where a person could certainly take offense to that. Um, but, uh, but at the, at the same, at the same time, I would also argue that that is what marriage is um, not denying the special relationship and the friendship that two people of the same gender can have together. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't want to take anything away from the, the, the beautiful sharing of your life experience with another human being. Um, because, um, well, and I know that, I mean, just even having a good friend, you know, and I, I can't even imagine somebody that, that have chosen to commit their lives one to another where that would be. And, and it's because of that, that commitment that they make one to another, um, where I can see where they would take offense to that. So but is it, but what you're saying is, but if you put it in the naughty place, <laughs> it's all, uh, it, 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 we're talking about a different ball game here. Well, I mean, it's uh, in... It's I think those are two separate issues. I do. Because you could have sex before marriage and it'd be just... I don't want to say just the same, but it would be viewed by Christianity as the same. Uh, it'd fall into the category of sinful use of our sexuality. So I think it's, I think it's, I think it's two separate issues. I think it's the... Um, is it right or wrong to, to have homosexual sex? And then the other issue is, is it right or wrong to try to legislate whether it should be allowed for people to get married or whether it shouldn't be? And, well, and, and, and I would say that we, I, I think we agree that uh, regulating or legislating uh, this uh, morality on the basis of Scripture is unconstitutional. And I agree with that 100%. Should be completely off the table. I agree with that 100%, but I would even take it a step further and, 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 and to wipe Christianity off the face of it. It's not also just Christianity, Ken. I think what we're right. really trying to get to is it's just people who don't understand it. They're afraid of it. And there is a group of people who go, oh, well, well, God said some stuff about it, so we're going to use that as a reason to define our fear. But, but there's hear, people who don't believe in God who hate homosexuals. But we hear senators all the time say, that in, in fact, Obama at one point was asked, you know, what is your definition of, of marriage or do, and he, and he said, my faith teaches me that marriage is between one man and one woman. Well, right there, to me, that's off the table. If you're basing, you know, how you're going to legislate yeah. on your biblical teachings, on your faith, then that's, that's off the table. And the people chose him. <laughs> and that's kind of the, the thing that we're stuck with is um, – you know, do you want a leader who who publicly talks about where they lead from? Um, you know, I I'm of the mindset that you know I'm not a super big fan of Obama, <laughs> so I can also remember speeches where he defended uh, gay marriage. So it's kind of like, okay, so what topic are you really going to stick for? Now, granted, well, I come from the guy's his opinion on yeah, I come from the guy's state, okay. so I probably have seen him do things here 
before he ran for president that I wouldn't agree with as far as uh, he, I, I personally believe that he was very wishy-washy. He purposely didn't vote certain ways so that he couldn't be accused of going one way or the other. To me, that's not a leader, but that's a whole other discussion. And I, and I personally believe that he always held this belief or he held, he held the belief uh, – that he supposedly changed about homosexuality. Uh, I, I think he held that belief. I don't know. He got elected before he got elected. And yeah, he, I, I don't he wouldn't know. have been able to get elected had he publicly mm. announced that he held that belief. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. I don't. Guess, we can't say. You know, obviously we can only take a guy at his word, but. Yeah. But he changes them so often, so <laughs> it's hard to say. Um, hey, listen, you know, we're, 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 we're quickly fast approaching the end of the time here, but. Um, and, and, and to be fair, we never expected to solve the problem. <laughs> uh, we just wanted to, to have a conversation. And I think that's the real issue here is uh, from all parties involved and, and fully recognizing that we didn't have anybody who is homosexual on here to speak as well. And we respect that. And we could definitely revisit this further down the road. This is just an example of the sorts of things we want to talk about. But I think I think it needs to be said, and, I, and I'm pretty sure that we can all be in agreement that no side of the issue will ever get better if we don't talk about it more. Amen to that. I agree. We okay. need to keep talking about it. Um, you know, the whole thing about, you know, whether we agree right or wrong. Uh, I, 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 one thing I, that I've come away from this learning is that it really is two separate issues. It really, because I, I was putting, I was lumping them together. And I think I was ignorantly doing that. I was lumping homosexuality and gay marriage together, and I don't think you can do that. I think it's two separate matters. Um, I think how how the church, and when I say church, I don't necessarily mean God's people. I just mean um, the movement of Christianity. But the, how the church views gay sex in is not necessarily the same thing as what people in Congress and the Senate are trying to legislate. And that is an issue in itself. And um, I think we could probably, it sounded to me that all three of us were in agreement that really the government has no business trying to legislate one way or the other on the matter. It really, there's really no point of it. Well, that's, that's one where I would, I guess I would, okay. I would take a little bit different stance, but you know, it's. Uh, sure, sure. But I, I don't want to make assumptions either. I mean, I just, I, I thought, and uh, if I'm wrong, that's, that's totally fine. I just, uh, <laughs> I personally right. believe that, that uh, my United States government, in which I I love my country, I, I'm sure we all do. Um, I I feel that we have a lot bigger fish to fry than than this particular issue. There are a lot of things out there that that are worthy of discussion, worthy of a good podcast. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I would also go so far as to say that I I, I hope that we're all in agreement that really nobody should be trying to stand in the way of somebody who loves another person, period. Can, can, I, can I get an amen on that one or no? <laughs> I'll even say amen to that one, brothers. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, and, 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 you know, again, I... I, I I'll, agree, I'll, I'll agree with that. I'll agree yeah, with that. Yeah, I mean... We should be promoting people who love one another. Yes, too. yes. And I will go so far as a believer, as a Christian, as a follower of Christ... I will go so far as to say that I have been hard-pressed to find anything that Jesus said against homosexuality, personally. I don't believe he said anything in the, in the Gospels. Yeah. There's I, I, I personally have Is there? not. Father? Well, if, if we want to start again. <laughs> and, and you know what? If he, if he did, we will definitely talk about it. We'll definitely, we'll, we'll definitely have you back on, and we'll definitely talk about it. But for me personally, it, from what I've read in the Gospels, I've never heard Jesus say, I don't want men to have sex with other men, or I don't want them to be married. The uh, well, the, the the definition comes from Matthew uh, Matthew sixteen or nineteen. I'm very oh, Matthew nineteen. Teach um, me. Well, all right, all right. So the uh, the the main the main question there would be that um, where Jesus in nineteen Matthew nineteen where he makes reference all the way back to the very beginning as far as being made male and female. In the beginning, like, and, and that actually is more so in, in denunciation of divorce, um, where he makes reference. He says, Moses permitted you to have divorce, but in the beginning it was not so. In the beginning he made them male and female, um, and he, he brings it into that, to that original male-female um, I, I would argue that's almost defensive gay marriage. Because okay. it's flat out said 
in the beginning it wasn't the case, but then Moses permitted you to, to do something different. God is not, God does not change, but I've seen God change his mind biblically. Well, again, I guess that comes back Sodom to... Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> sure enough. And it comes back to the question of how do we read scripture? You yeah. know, how do we, how do we, uh, how do we do that? Which, uh, I took enough courses in seminary <laughs> regarding that. <laughs> I just read the words. That's that's all I do. And then, yeah, that, and that's all I can do too is read the words and uh, you know, and then talk to people like Father Nels who have a six year degree. <laughs> um, but in this particular passage, is it, it's it's talking about divorce and uh, the fact that and Jesus basically says that I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. So in the context, in the broader context of that, yeah. you know. Well, and there should be more than and a woman, and, and being that they were in the beginning, the Creator made them male and female. For this reason, a male will leave his father and a mother, and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So that they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. And I think there's a lot more to the theological aspect of it when you look at historically in the time what was happening was that men were literally, divorce at that time was men were literally kicking the women out into the streets. Mm-hmm. And, and it, when Jesus was like, what the heck are you doing? You know, you don't, you don't just kick them out of your home. And a woman leaves her parents' home and enters into your home. It's, a for, it's for security. It's for, it's for um, flourishment of life. And you just decide you don't want to be with her anymore, so you kick her out. She's got nowhere to go. And that was Jesus' way of saying, okay, that's, that's not cool. At least yeah, that's the way I read it. Yeah, no, and that's, that's I would say, an, an element of it. Um, but to make, to make reference all the way to, like, for example, specifically a man and a woman, to, to make reference to the one fleshness um, and, uh, you know, to, to this idea of the, the joining of the two for some purpose beyond just simply um, friendship. To, uh, to bring it all the way back to the whole Genesis story of creation, uh, there's, there's quite a bit more going on there than just, and I agree with you that the, the social concerns as far as the treatment of women in, in these types of cases um, was, was a part of it. Um, and that's, that's the beauty of Scripture is, though, is that it, it has all these things tied together, that there's not necessarily exclusively one uh, teaching that our Lord wants to convey through the passages. Um, but this is this is where too I think and again this is a very Catholic understanding is that uh, we're guided not only by sacred scripture but sacred tradition um, and so the like, we've always uh, done it that way <laughs> not no no specifically <laughs> not that oh specifically not that oh my gosh you see that's that's why it oh my gosh it takes so long to, to teach my no I know I, I was just being a smart I love it. I, I, love I it. did that because I know that that's how so many people have defended themselves and it's it's, it's terrible it's, well that's just it that's why like I, I hope I hope that the stances that I take on whatever issue it is are defensible um, but, you know that it's not just because we've always done the way I hope that I have uh, a well thought out um, articulated defense for whatever my stance is on anything from the reason I think the speed limit should be, you know, 30 in a, in a neighborhood or, uh, or the reason that I think uh, a government, you know, should be structured as such. I hope that I have something other than simply either we've always done it this way or because I feel like it. I, that's what I hope at least. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I will definitely say um, we, we unfortunately have definitely run out of time. Ken, was there something <laughs> else you really wanted to, to touch on or? No, I, I'm good, and I want to thank Father Nels for coming by. Absolutely. And uh, this has been fantastic. I think that we've, uh, you know, we've raised some uh, some more questions, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I don't think we've gotten any answers necessarily. <laughs> no, and again, that was, for never, some people, and that that's was never the goal. That was never the goal. The, the whole goal here was to just show that it is possible to talk. Exactly, and to educate, you know, I, I've learned I've learned some things here, and I hope our listeners have learned some things, and um, it's given me some good, you know, information to sort of chew on and, and think yeah. about, and uh, and we want to hear what everybody else is thinking about. So send us an email at pushthebuttonpodcast at gmail dot com. You can hit us on Twitter at pushbuttonpod, and uh, check us out on Facebook and stuff like that. Give us a five star review on iTunes. And uh, guys, really, I mean, this is this is awesome. I, I love that we have the ability to do this. Thirty years ago, we couldn't have done this, so this is cool. And I think that that's progress for all of us. 
So, uh, Father Nels, thank you so much for, for taking the time out of your day and, and spending it with us. And uh, I, I'm glad to have met you, and uh, I really love talking with you, and I hope we can do it some more. Yeah, thank you very much. I just have to get back to that funeral I had to step out of for this. So, <laughs> <laughs> They're waiting patiently in the, uh, in the church or in the uh, funeral home. You got it. Well, stay tuned, folks, for the next episode of Push the Button, where we'll talk about things that are going to get you hot and bothered. Um, hey, but hey, not, hey, 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 what? Don't get hot. <laughs> well, from the Push the Button podcast, I am David Vox Mullen. And I'm Mr. Anderson. Anderson. I was waiting for you to cut me off. No, 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 no. I've learned my lesson this episode. We'll see what happens next time. Uh, thank you so much, Father Nels, once again. And we look forward to seeing everybody back next time. Mr. Anderson. Don't push it.